Sometimes when I close my eyes, I can hear the ever encroaching sound of a beating drum. Specifically, a 32-bit Game Boy Advance sound font beaten drum. It personifies a primal need to spread the good word of Mother 3 on YouTube. Following dark aspects of Mother, this video is an addendum. A bonus episode focusing on one of these two Vaporware 64 disk drive games headed by Shigesato Itoi. And I'll give you a hint, it isn't cabbage. Now you may be asking, wait, Mother 64? What about Mother 4, 5, and 6 through 63? <coughs> Bad jokes aside, and as an aside, Etoy was actually responsible for naming this classic console, according to the 64 Dream November 1996 interview as translated by Chewy. Mother or Earthbound 64 in the West, aka Mother 3 before it was cancelled and released later on the Game Boy Advance, had a couple of subtitles it was known by before landing on the sublime Fall of the Pig King. They were Forest of the Chimera and Forest of Strange Creatures. Those last two subtitles, of course, place emphasis on the reconstructed creatures of the game. The final, official subtitle, Fall of the Pig King, presumably refers to Master Porky Minch, the game's main antagonist, who was confirmed to return by art director Binimaru Ito, Satoru Iwata, and Itoi himself. So what more do we know about Mother 64 specifically? And why have I chosen to make a Dark Aspects about a game that never saw the light of day? Well, this Nintendo Dream Magazine interview, again translated by Chewy, that is required reading for any Mother 3 fan I've probably referenced too much in my videos, outright tells us from the man himself that the scenario in the N64 version was much, much darker. When Itoi initially wrote a script a decade prior to this interview, he apparently wasn't presented with as many confrontations when it came to dark aspects and sad aspects. Sad aspects? New series for this channel, anyone? Anyway, he initially thought to dig in the direction that would upset people, making for a scenario that was dirtier than what it turned into for the Game Boy Advance version. Itoi then mentioned there were parts that he had only added in order to disappoint the players. After being asked why the GBA version ended up with a lightened scenario, Etoy guessed that it's because he became a good person. This original idea to betray the player was elaborated on in the February 1997 Dengeki Nintendo 64 interview, archived by The Cutting Room Floor and Mother Forever, where Etoy mentions the plot including a betrayal longtime fans might have been expecting for a long time. Someone other than Etoy, the lead programmer in charge of Mother 64's scenario, suggested in 1999 that Mother as a series is always about betraying fans of the previous game, and had this to say about Mother 64. If you're expecting the heartwarming world of Mother 2, you might suddenly be betrayed. Itoi was always fascinated with evoking a feeling of disgust within the player, metaphorically describing the theme of Mother 3 as being the literally disgusting sound of Master Belch's synthesized burp from the previous game, and other unpleasant ideas like it. In Itoi's words, the theme of the project was a lot like playing against Master Belch, with many twists and turns along the way. About two years later, Miura would describe the main theme of Mother 3 as a desire to make people cry. Very interestingly, in this June 27, 1997 Weekly Famitsu interview, Itoi mentions the game's story being sad. The interviewer remarks that they cried during Mother 2, but Itoi comments that it's not really like that. This game's story is more like, this is terrible, why is this happening to me? Then, in December of that same year, Itoi said rather than simply crying at the end of the game, you'll be crying halfway through, which is accurate, though I was wanting to cry within the first hour of the final version. He then proclaims the end might make you freeze and go, what? Really, it's a cruel game. Of course, we can mostly only speculate on what exactly changed between these two versions of Mother 3. But luckily, due to the strenuous efforts of the community, including Mother Forever and their exceptional discoveries and documentation of all things Mother 64, we have plenty of supplemental materials like the Mother Three Times, featuring English translations I'll be quoting from The Cutting Room Floor and Cody Nocolo, that will show us what could have been, with many clearly darker elements planned that aren't present in the Mother 3 we know now, which will be the main focus of this video. Note that because it would happen quite a bit from here on out, instead of audibly saying quote unquote every time I directly reference a Mother 3 Times article, I'm going to show a scan of the original page and its translated text whenever I read from it. 
You can also always turn on subtitles to see the nuances of my script, which reveals when exactly I'm quoting the cutting room floor and or Cody slash the Mother Forever team's work. With that out of the way, let's first discuss the curious case of missing and or kidnapped villagers, which Mother 64 had a surprising amount of. The town lumberjack Leiter of GBA Mother 3 apparently used to be known as Captain Leiter, and he owned a fishing boat called the Hatemi Maru. His son's name is still Fuel, though in this version, they both went missing when out on a voyage, and were thankfully rescued 5 kilometers offshore near Great Scale Village, a location that likely became what we know as Cerulean Beach. While sailing southbound, the family was reportedly attacked by some mysterious large creature. The two of them suffered minor injuries, though seemed to otherwise be in good health, so they were taken to Asohe for recovery, where the Asohe Coast Guard plans to interview them once they've fully healed. The truly grim news in this though is that Leiter's wife, a Mother 64 exclusive character named Tobacco, was apparently also on board the boat and went missing along with them, but was never found and therefore presumed dead. The creature that attacked the fishing boat was very likely the two-headed Great Scale Kraken, who snatched up fuel from the back of its mouth in this 1997 screenshot, and in this space world sizzle reel footage recovered by Zen64. Another missing seafarer is Nana's Papa, who one day disappeared from his home on the west side of Tasmili. According to the Mother Three Times, since he was formerly a sailor, Papa would occasionally leave suddenly for voyages. However, this time seemed different, since he hadn't returned. All he left behind for his 12-year-old daughter was a photo, which she holds close to her chest each day as she anxiously awaits his return. Both Papa and Nana are said to be close friends of Lucas's family, so this news must be especially tragic for them. That's a mystery unique to Mother 64 that's been left without closure for over two decades. But the case of a pair of missing siblings, Nicole and Richie, was resolved well before then. Mado of Legends of Localization does seem to think that these two were named after Nicole Ritchie, by the way. The brother and sister duo wandered into the Sunshine Forest one afternoon to play, but failed to return home by dinner time. They were rescued by a gentle, huge creature believed to be a Drago, and brought back to Tasmili Village that same day. Another case of a missing child, though left without a resolution, is amusingly the character who has the face of Hiroki Mukudani. You see, Hiroki was the winner of the Mother 64 fan insert contest, with his likeness in-game being based upon photos that were sent to the game's art director. An important clue to the investigation of the missing boy reveals that he was spotted on the security cameras of the Daily Necessities retailer, the uh, creatively named General Store, in the suburbs of Tasmili. The Mother 3 Times goes on to describe that, it is clear the person seen in the camera is 12-year-old Mukodani-kun, who's been missing for some time. It is under the assumption of the Tasmili Village Police Department that the middle-aged man seen on camera with the boy is involved in the incident. The boy was last heard from in October of last year, when he said, I want to eat some deep fried shrimp with chili. He's been missing ever since he left home that day. It's unclear who exactly that middle-aged man was supposed to be, but one suspect could be this supposed creep found lurking in Tasmili, who calls himself a carefree guy, which is supposed to be a reference to the enemy of the same name from Mother 1 and 2. Us overseas fans know him as the New Age Retro Hippie, which is a far superior name. Funnily enough, the fourth wall breaking article questions whether or not he is indeed the same baddie that starred in the previous games, and suggests that until the rumor is proven false, the security of the villagers of Tasmili must be taken to heart and arranged. None of the villagers have been harmed yet, but apparently there is an overhanging feeling of anxiety among the people including Mayor P.K. Perkle. It's such a widespread fear, in fact, that a general late-night curfew has been put into place, as well as a mandate for all elementary school students to head for and leave school together. Finally, a special investigative headquarters has been set up in Tasmili Village in order to study this man. All of these happenings, to me, suggest that Mother 3 initially incorporated a lot more investigation elements into its narrative and gameplay, which makes a whole lot of sense when considering what Etoy had to say about Mother 3's initial conception, from the official Earthbound 64 cancellation interview. I wanted to do a simple detective story where the city was the main character, then there'd be a hack detective who makes a living on investigating affairs and stuff like that. He's a womanizer, who meddles into the business of the girl at the flower shop, takes a train to the next town over to work on a case, goes to the library to research materials, and lives off of the money he gets by solving petty little cases. 
So I thought of a project to have this worthless detective caught up in a huge murder case he starts to solve. The most important part of the plot was going to be how the story from the flower shopkeeper would change from one day to the next. That would start to add up bit by bit. She wouldn't say it the day before, but the next day, when a man really passes by and you question her again that a man had passed by. It'd be a game about a city that continues to grow. I started making Mother 3 with that concept at its core. Remnants of this early idea for what Itoi wanted Mother 3 to be is still apparent in this 2006 release. With Tazmili Village growing and changing over time, Flint searching for his missing family members, and Lucas later investigating Wes's lost son, Duster. However, it appears that many more characters were slated to disappear in the 64 days, which would have certainly felt more like Itoi's aforementioned desire to craft a detective story. This role of hard-boiled hack detective would have also fit Flint as a character, so I'd guess that's the reason. The polygonal widower was apparently going to have a larger role in the plot than his pixelated counterpart. We're not even done talking about mysteries yet though, as there's tons of distinct, eerie enemies to discuss, including one that will now forever haunt my dreams. This shadowy entity simply named that. The Mother Three Times reports on a photographer they sent ahead to Tazmili Village, who succeeded in snapping a picture of the creature, but was not able to capture all of its body in frame due to the cameraman's shock. That apparently has a habit of fluttering towards children and flying into their faces, so the article understandably recommends being wary when visiting Tasmili Village. Speaking of unsettling flying things, The Mother Three Times also published a segment about a different mysterious creature a large number of villagers claim to bear witness to. According to these reports, the apparent rat with insect wings was about 40 centimeters in length, flying around the sky attacking humans and livestock. It supposedly admits a crying sound like Gee, Gee, which is worth noting because Mother 1 and 2 antagonist Gee's name was inspired by how unpleasant and dreadful Etoy thought the syllable Gee specifically sounds to the ears. In 64-bit Tasmili, the villagers are extremely concerned that the unknown creature may be poisonous. So to help curb the mass panic, the Tasmili Health Center began developing a strategy to catch it, involving a special mousetrap. Another big difference I noticed between the Mother 3 back then and now is Isaac. And no, it's not the fact that his older design reflects that of a troglodyte in a loincloth. In the Mother 3 we got, Isaac is implied to have heard Hinawa's death throes while he was up in the mountains, taking a break by the river after picking mushrooms. In Mother 64, instead of hearing the sounds of screams, Isaac reportedly saw what were likely pig masks called Buhe, or Pig Warriors, in early promotional material while picking mushrooms in the forest, followed by a crop circle spinning around and dissipating, leaving behind a searing mark in the ground. Apparently, these so-called crop circles have been reported all over the world, too. Isaac does look drastically different in the early days compared to his final design, but so do some other notable characters, including the Claymen. According to that English translation of the post-launch Nintendo Dream Magazine interview, Itoi said this in response to the interviewer, asking about the Claymen having appeared since Mother 3's N64 years. The design of the Claymen has always been a theme I've been working on in my mind. I felt their design this time was okay, but to tell you the truth, I still feel like the very best Claymen design would have turned out differently. Clearly, the look of the Claymen was incredibly important to Itoi. We can see physical proof of that by comparing and contrasting how much their designs changed between versions. These hapless slaves of sadness and endless sorrow originally looked much more pliable, featuring a shocked looking face with a perpetual open mouth akin to Animal Crossing's gyroids. Which is very fitting because gyroids in turn were inspired by terracotta clay figures called Haniwa. Hinawa? See, now we've come full circle. Sort of off topic, but this 5 second clip from the Space World 1999 trailer utterly perplexed me before I knew it was supposed to be a clay man. With the perspective, I always thought it was a bizarre looking save frog or some kind of chimera climbing out of the water. Let's hope that this clay man made it out to safety, and pour one out for the Yado Garin in the meantime. These crustaceans have apparently declined in number due to recent developments in the forests. Thanks, pig masks. This screenshot here, taken at the 64 exclusive Toilet Falls, showcases an interesting bit of dialogue, reading something like, Dad, help me! In the GBA release, Flint never actually hears either of his sons yelling out for help in this way. 
When he and Alec are closing in on Klaus at the Drago Plateau, for example, he finds both of his boy's shoes as proof Klaus was there, but not a voice or body to match them with. Some other video and screenshots worth mentioning is of course what looks like the aftermath of an earthquake, with the rubble containing an Onet billboard and burger sign, along with a crumbled Monotoli building from Forsyth. Could this have been a flashback that would have played during Leader's speech towards the end of the game? Here's a fully charred model of Salsa with bloodshot eyes, after likely being electrocuted by Facade, along with the caged up monkeys being carried off by pig masks. This screen of Kumatora and Lucas is… interesting. There's also a ghost of Wes, but he probably wasn't meant to pass away as part of the story. This looks like a 3D interpretation of what happens in Mother 1 and 2 when the heroes fall in battle, suggesting that Wes at one point was planned to be a fully player-controlled party member who could be revived after quote-unquote dying. This is supported by an in-battle screenshot from 2000, listing his name and stats. His level in the GBA version can even be adjusted in the debug room. While on the topic of death, we have a Mother series wall staple, Zombies. The only zombies that appear in GBA Mother 3 are the Zombie Man and Zombie Lady, featuring physical attributes reminiscent of Klaus and Hinawa respectively, which is a sad thought, and the sheer body horror that is the Zombie Dog. None of them resemble a cyborg though, which certainly appears to be the direction Mother 64 was going for, as this dude with an almost fully metal face looks up into the camera with a robotic glowing red eye. Nippolite, the gravekeeper here, also used to look strikingly like the Legend of Zelda's Dompe of the same profession. Zombies rising from the graveyard was likely going to be a bigger plot point as well, as evidenced by this publication discussing Mayor Perkle's plans to renovate Sunset Cemetery to put to rest rumors of the walking dead. Everyone will feel safe in the new cemetery. You could sleep in it and have the time of your lives. Then there's the overt nightmare fuel that is this fortune teller always be with you advertisement starring Ionia. The low resolution and lighting makes this completely horrifying. So it's probably my favorite promotional picture, right up there with this pig mask hanging from a tree. As far as concept art, and as the last thing I'll be discussing today, I wanted to bring to light this piece by Ito, depicting a village of unfortunate people in tattered clothing. One of them is attempting to eat a boot. Then there's this dog over here with what looks like a human foot in its mouth, and a building that reads, Polkies, which we can safely presume is meant to be Porkies, as English L and R's are commonly a hurdle for Japanese speakers, and so they're sometimes mixed up. That's all I had for the dark aspects of Mother 64. It's been a ton of fun finally reading up on all of this stuff more in depth. I feel a lot more confident in my knowledge of this unreleased game and wish to thank the team at Mother Forever for all their archived resources that helped make this video a reality. For more things Earthbound, Nintendo, and Dark Aspects, please consider subscribing to the channel and or joining the PK Rockin slash love tier on the Thane Gaming Patreon to help support my dream of making content creation my day job. Thank you all as always for watching. I'll be back with more Mother videos soon. But before that, here's a couple of bonus Dark Aspects for those of you who saw this video through to its end. Number 1. Shogo Sakai, Mother 3's composer, once described His Highness's theme as a song that gives off a poisonous, twisted feeling, like a ruling fist. Number 2. In a March 2000 interview translated by MyCom Inc., Itoi said this when asked about Mother 4. The production difficulties associated with Mother 3 have demoralized us, to the point where we don't want to do a 4. At this point, a Mother 4 is completely out of the question. The development team would hang themselves. Cheers! If you've ever been curious about just how different the official Mother novel is from the game it's based on, you should know that in this interpretation, when our protagonist Ninten first encounters Geek, his instinct is to call him a bastard and throw a grenade at him. Welcome to Dark Aspects of the Mother Novels, a complete analysis of the darker moments present in author Saori Kumi's retelling of the first two games by Shigesato Itoi. This episode will be a comprehensive overview of the first book, which does include spoilers pretty much immediately, so I recommend reading it first if you have any interest in doing so. I want to turn this comment section into a book club.
In my last related video about the decades-long journey to getting these Japanese novels translated into English, I mentioned that the first story is all about Ninten, or as he's referred to in this fine piece of literature, Ken. However, he isn't exactly the main character. He's one of them as a chosen hero for sure, but in a move I think made for a more interesting read, the book actually takes place right before Anna joins Ninten slash Ken and Lloyd's party, because this story is told through the perspective of Anna who is 100% a better character than Ken here, at least in terms of attitude. This author's version of Ninten is a loud, rude, and crude kid with no patience for anything except his mission, which is to save the world, yes, but nevertheless, he's a butthead most of the time. Ken does have a couple of redeeming factors though, like his wholesome, unbreakable friendship with Lloyd. They still fight, and Ken picks on him occasionally for being a burden, but despite his low tolerance for other people's problems, he's surprisingly accommodating. Lloyd himself is a genius with technology, but laments his all-eggs-in-one-basket expertise, as it's no help in saving his mother, who's dying from an illness that can supposedly only be treated with the incredibly rare cannon flower, which is amusingly not canon in the game. Curing his mom is a major reason why he's joined forces with Ken and Anna as an ally of justice, a member of what they've dubbed the Global Defense Force, with the ultimate goal of saving their planet from a certain universal cosmic destroyer. While the Famicom slash NES Ninten and Anna were clearly interested in each other romantically, that really isn't the case with Ken and Anna. Since we do get a lot of internal monologue from Anna in the book, we see that she despises him in a lot of ways, but does, while well, she'd never admit it out loud, have several moments where she's crushing on the kid. As I was reading each chapter and getting closer to the end of the book, I kept wondering to myself what the author's version of the game's intimate dance scene could even be, assuming Kumi decided to reference it at all. These characters are friends, but they still don't really get along all that well towards the end of their adventure so I just couldn't picture it. But of course, Kumi found an interesting workaround, in the vein of Mother 2's Moonside and Mother 3's Tane Tane Island. That's right, Mother 1 now gets its own hallucinogenic sequence outside of Magicant, involving the consumption of holy water in a limestone cavern. Utterly alluring Anna with some unseen power, the reportedly 500 feet deep pool of crystal clear water calls out to her, drawing the girl in with an irresistible force until she can't fight back. It convinces her that she wouldn't mind drifting forever and ever into eternity within its serene depths, a pure blue that happens to be the same color as Ken's eyes. The lake water is supposed to be freezing cold, and is known to have sent a good number of divers to their doom, but when Anna touches it, the refreshing sensation is so vivid that her own body and heart feel lukewarm and tainted in comparison. She then clumsily scoops up the beautiful blue with her hands and brings it to her lips sipping the delicious, cell-changing, sensory overload water that tastes like moonlight. When Ken is convinced to drink it for himself, the two stare into each other's eyes, and an intense passion they think is love overtakes them in that moment. They become so absorbed in each other's love, in fact, that they don't even notice the war zone of gunfire that surrounds them. Their new psychic shield keeps them completely safe to indulge in this newfound bliss, which the robots catch on to and, as a result, proceed to target the only vulnerable hero left, Hurricane Joe, aka Teddy from the original, who's described here as a bear-like man donning two bandoliers in the shape of an X, with a carbine gun slung over his shoulder while wielding a machete. He can down eight beers no problem, and slap away an entire motorcycle with his bare open hand without twitching. When Ken and Anna finally come to from their trance, they suddenly realize what had taken place around them with a whiff of the copious amount of blood, and Joe's severely injured body collapsed onto the floor, with no memory of their special moment together. I think this was a brilliant equivalent to the game's events, where Teddy is gravely wounded in an unwinnable encounter. Before that life-threatening ordeal, Ninten and Anna legitimately confess their feelings for each other without drinking a mind-altering substance, then dance with one another, similar to Ken and Anna here enveloping themselves to be as close as possible inside of an invincible bubble. If that description of what happened to Joe was any indication, the battles in this book are much more descriptively violent than their in-game counterparts. This makes sense, as while nothing overly gruesome is ever shown on screen in Mother, some of the implications of the turn-based fights, like Ninten using a baseball bat to beat possessed zoo animals, suggest some pretty intense battle scenarios. The novel trio's first fisticuffs is described as early as Chapter 2, 
when Ken, Lloyd, and Anna are circled by four giant voracious white wolves with breath that smells of blood. Their teeth are as sharp as knives, and behind the rows of those ferocious fangs are rolling, twitching tongues tinged with black. Unlike the game, we're told explicitly what kind of a blow Ken lands with his bat. An explosive three-base hit to the muzzle he reportedly takes great pride in. Right before the wolves retreat into the depths of the forest, they collapse in the snow as their legs begin to convulse, while the evil possession seems to drain from their faces. That's nothing compared to the next ambush, though, involving hordes upon hordes of seemingly endless bloodthirsty mice, summoned by what Anna thought was a friendly one. Countless mice with pointed teeth ready to tear the three of them to shreds form into a tall, fuzzy mass leveled to the top of Lloyd's head, and spread wide to cover every square inch of the floor, like some awful mousy carpeting. They gnaw and thrash around, targeting any exposed skin they can sink their teeth into, a ghastly predicament straight out of a nightmare. Anna is blinded from a series of tail whips and starts to lose consciousness because of the sheer quantity of rodents overwhelming her. And when she falls to the ground, she hears the pitiful little chirps of mice who are now pinned underneath her. Ken does end up rescuing her, but it's now time to talk about the character I, and English fan translator Niasu Nekoban, think is the best in the novel, Lloyd. It is Lloyd who first shows kindness towards Anna and even makes a move on her about 20 pages in by giving what Anna describes as a terribly brief kiss on her hand. Fun fact, this excerpt was the first of Kenny Sue's translations he and Mado decided to post on Earthbound Central, which actually inadvertently soured some fans on reading it, because they thought the entire book was just going to be some cheap, mushy teen romance novel. The comment section here is pretty funny. Of course, romance is not the main focus of this adventure at all, but I did want to talk about one of my favorite related moments involving Lloyd, when he agrees to marry off Ken, without Ken's permission, mind you, to the owner of the Rosemary Mansion's daughter for his blessing to enter the property. The funniest thing about this, besides Ken absolutely exploding in anger when he finds out, is the fact that his apparent future father-in-law supports and encourages his daughter's desire to be wed to this boy, having only just met him, and despite his complete lack of decency. Wolfing down food at a fancy feast offered by Mr. Rosewater, Ken lets out an enormously offensive belch after their host opens his heart to talk about the purity and happiness he wishes for his daughter. Everyone in the room falls dead silent, but the man continues on by feigning ignorance. This genuinely got a laugh out of me. Progressing chronologically from here, the hero's search for eight magical melodies takes them to the Yucca Desert, rumored to have been the site of a battle fought long ago between countries. It's an area haunted by the spirits of those who died in this conflict, with an impressive negative 103 skull and crossbones tourist rating. Later, when a formation of UFOs is spotted overhead, a lot of them duck down into the shadows of the sand dunes. However, Lloyd is delirious and wants to see the flying saucers, so he crawls on all fours to get a better view, but is greeted by a scorpion instead. Anna uses her ability to telepathically communicate with creatures to calm it down, but unfortunately, as soon as Thoid safely backs away, Ken sends the no longer threatening Scorpion's helpless, tiny red body flying into the distance. My own grandmother doesn't have psychic powers to lull Scorpions out of stinging or anything like that, but she does live in Arizona, like me, and has had to land several smash attacks on hostile Scorpions that have invaded her home. One of them even snuck its way inside the pages of a book she was reading. Seriously. I just wanted to tell that story as this is a legitimate trope about the desert, but so is the wonderful stargazing out here, so don't hesitate to visit. Because Ken smacked an innocent scorpion with his bat, he and Anna yell at each other about how an ally of justice should be acting, and then she starts praying for him, which is amazing. The old man of the desert considers himself a gravekeeper of sorts, since so many of the men who were once under his command are now at rest beneath the sand. That's why he's never been able to bring himself to leave. He also owns a creepy blood-sucking plant with petals in the shape of lips that ask to be fed, stored away in a greenhouse along with a singing cactus fans of the game might recognize. Or so he thinks, but it looks like the thing sprouted legs and ran away. But not to worry, there are more singing cacti in the ruins occupied by monkeys, hidden deep within the desert. These ruins seem far more dangerous to navigate than they were in-game, as Anna accidentally activates a death trap that makes the earth around her tremble and the architecture crumble, causing some of the monkeys to either fall off of or be crushed by falling pieces of the ruined walls. Huge fissures crack open beneath her and the boy's feet, revealing wide, deep chasms that would certainly bring them to their demise if they fell in. 
all of this madness eventually leads the heroes through a portal to Magicant, a world which curiously makes Anna feel a bit of blackness in her heart, as an innate rejection of the nauseating pink atmosphere, and the boys over enthusiasm in being here. To be fair, it isn't their fault. They seem to be entranced, as if they're love-struck, stuck in a dreamy, thoughtless, too happy state that sickens Anna. My favorite description of them in Magicant is as follows. Those overly familiar girls were very insistent as they led Ken steadily onward, tugging at his hands. Lloyd called after them in a very nasal voice, saying something like, Aw, wait for me! And then, like a butterfly charmed by nectar, he fluttered off to join them. Her black-tainted heart in this strange place also comes from a place of concern and anxiety. As they enter Queen Mary's castle, the distance between her and the boys never seem to close in, despite her quickened pace, as she catches fleeting glimpses of them from behind, whenever they all turn a corner. She then has a twisted vision of them not remembering Anna's name, with their eyes turning a hazy, sugary shade of pink to match this blushing dreamland. The soldiers of the Queen's throne room are intimidating, as they wield spears adorned with cords colored wine red, giving them the dreadful appearance of having just finished stabbing someone to death. Anna speaking up against the queen, whisking them away to her fantasy to indulge while the real world is suffering, even in fear of being executed, is a great character moment for her. Queen Mary is fortunately not malicious, but does admit to doting over her children a bit too much. She brought them here for that selfish reason, but also to give them gifts, blessed with attributes best suited for the intended recipient, similar to Father Christmas of Narnia and his presents, while also successfully conveying that feeling of earning endgame equipment in an RPG. Each armor piece is bestowed with a magical ability. Ken's new baseball hat brings him strength as a leader by encouraging those with righteous hearts to follow him without hesitation. Lloyd's snazzy pair of glasses help boost his mental acuity like a wisdom capsule, and a glittering heart-shaped necklace for Anna has comparatively vague powers of love, truth, and hope that channels her natural ability to awaken boys from their delusions and turn them into real men, or something like that. Now that the heroes are geared up, but before moving on from Queen Mary's domain, I want to highlight a notable quote, suggesting that her dreamy country never truly vanishes when her completed song is sung, unlike what happens in the game. This is a place that anyone may call home, as it remains in the depths of one's subconscious for all of eternity. Taking off their figurative rose-tinted goggles, lands the Warriors of Justice in Youngtown, where all the adults have been puzzlingly abducted and taken to Mount Toy. This was also the place Anna's own mother went missing, when she had to travel here on business for the church. With all these lost children yet no one to supervise them, an orphan named Amy seized the opportunity to take control. Apparently, there were a good number of kids who mistakenly thought that they could become the boss here, but they've all been sorted out by being knocked out with Amy's right hand punch. This society without grown-ups is where the gang also meets Noelle, the psychokinetic-powered baby with abilities that surpass even Anna, who senses and can teleport the party to the next melody, located in the notoriously dangerous LA. Famous for drugs, violence, and crime. An amazing void moment in this chapter is the boy leisurely strolling towards a group of violent bikers, with Joe, aka Teddy if you've forgotten, as their leader, to fix his motorcycle for him. Since this version of Lloyd's backstory involves a history of illegally copying and modding electronic bike software for money, so he's had plenty of experience. In this town that good little children are forbidden to visit, Anna spots a lone, dainty-looking gold-colored shoe by a bush. When she picks it up to get a closer look, she hears giggling from beyond the brush, and sees two or three pairs of bare legs, which makes her turn red all the way up to her ears. When the kids finally find a seemingly normal adult they can actually speak with, an elderly woman feeding animals in the park, she jumps and runs at the sight of them. There's also another pair of wild women waiting in the huge line gathered at the live house. One is practically naked, while the other walks around kissing anyone she can find. What I find to be truly funny, though, is that before the gang winds up being conned by purchasing fake passes, this book, based on a Nintendo game, blatantly tells us what the definition of a scalper is, as if we Nintendo fans aren't already well aware. To be fair, this was written in 1989, so I guess Kumi couldn't predict the sorry state of Amiibo, and any other limited edition Nintendo merchandise to come. Ken, Anna, and Floyd need tickets to the live show, because that's where they think they'll hear the next melody, alongside some no doubt sinful degenerate rock and roll music. Thankfully, despite being duped by a fraudulent ticket seller, 
Lloyd now knows a guy, that guy being Joe, the main performer everyone's apparently lining up to see. Now backstage, Lloyd quickly narrows in on the aforementioned cannon flower imperative to his personal mission at Joe's gift table, and secures it in spite of an ineffectual display of begging. In a panic to rush home to Marysville for the first time since the boy's initial departure, Anna mistakenly wakes up an already groggy Noel, who accidentally expends even more of his energy than necessary by teleporting everyone in the room, band members included, to Lloyd's hometown. Because Noel's powers are dependent on how well fed and rested he is, this happening towards the end of the story was a great way to ensure that they all can't just warp to Mount Toy for the final battle. Their fastest method of transportation is going to be dead asleep for a long while. So a group of them plan to make the arduous trip up the mountain themselves, aided by one of the Rockstar's SUVs. While in this ironically named town, both Ken and Lloyd learn that their mothers, along with every other mother, have been taken from their homes in Podunk and Marysville respectively by spaceships. Unlike Youngtown though, the rest of the adults were left behind, so they all banded together and agreed to wage war against the aliens, jointly pooling whatever they could use as weapons, then heading off to storm Mounty Toy. The only ones holding down the fort, so to speak, are self-described useless old men like Lloyd's neighbor and Ken's younger twin sisters who've been living in fear this entire time. Bawling in desperation with the special cannon flower in hand, Lloyd finds his house completely vacant and freaks out by presuming his mother's already passed. But he is ultimately able to coax himself out of a panic attack and calm down, by planting the flowers safely in their backyard garden with hope in his heart that she'll make it home okay. Anna was the only one in their group who saw this coming, and not through some premonition. She noticed that the huge fleet of saucers they all spotted back in the desert were flying in the direction of Marysville, but she didn't say anything to the boys in fear of deflating their will to soldier on. Lloyd's elderly neighbor Sam fills them all in on the remaining adults' rescue plan, despite it being doomed to fail because of Geeg's near-impenetrable psychic barrier. He notes the strange nature of Earth's animals and humans being hypnotized at random, along with all the mothers here specifically having been kidnapped, as if the enemy is desperately searching for something. Sam is closer than he probably realizes in solving this mystery, as Geeg is searching for something, or more specifically, someone, his own mom. In the original game, Geeg stored his human prisoners inside of test tubes within a cave near Mount Toy's summit, which had disconcerting implications for sure, but the descriptions of the brainwashed adults held captive at the mountain base in this book are far more disconcerting. Anna sees firsthand a huge crowd of possessed, injured-looking adults, covered in dirt, grease, grime, and sweat. She can hardly tell the difference between them all, as they've chaotically piled up on top of each other like one single living mass, with what may be corpses mixed in. Among the horde are friends of Anna's family, including Lily's mom, Natalie, a churchgoer who's now under Geeg's spell, mistaking Anna for her own daughter, like every other mother here desperately clinging on to the hapless girl with their filthy hands. The zombie-like adults seemingly begin fighting over her by pulling hair, scratching, biting, and landing bloody blows on one another. They've just about completely lost their minds. An overwhelmed Anna discharges a psi blast that sends anyone within a 20-foot radius around her flying, and is shocked to see that she inadvertently inflicted irreparable damage to fellow humans. We get a horrific account of what this feels like from Anna herself, as a second bout of that explosive energy is suppressed and redirected a course throughout her body. All of her blood seemed to boil, her bones seemed to grate against one another, and every one of her organs felt as though they'd been turned into minced meat from some kind of terrible shock. And all of this pain echoed five or six times stronger. Her entire body became numb, as though it wasn't even her own anymore. Thinking she deserves to be punished for having sinfully used this great power, Anna welcomes the pain and endures the suffering until it stops, which turns her hair, she offered up to God earlier in prayer as a sacrifice, Snow White. All this commotion is what causes Geeg to finally reveal himself. Housed in glass underneath his mothership are more adults, mindlessly calling out for their precious Geeg. It seems that without a mother to call his own, the alien threat has tried to fill the void by forcing all of Earth's mothers to love him instead. That was never going to replace the real thing, however, so with a time machine known as the ultimate reset button in his possession, Geeg's endgame is to send every single thing on Earth back to a state like being in a mother's womb all over again. 
The only thing our little heroes have on their side to match the might of his malevolence is the robot Eve, who was notably modeled after Lloyd's mom in the book because she was built by Dr. Distorto, a generic enemy type from the game made into a single character here that character being Lloyd's dad. Distorto is a cruel nickname given to Lloyd's father by Geek, whose army disfigured the man for feigning loyalty. Lloyd's papa explains that like an insect, Geek must retreat into a cocoon made out of his own body fluids at intervals during the course of his growth. Observing Geek's hibernation habits is how he managed to escape from the mothership, but he didn't flee unscathed as an Omega Saucer brutally shot him down. The incident left him with facial scars, deformed legs, and the total loss of his right hand. The man became estranged from Lloyd to try and revive his mortally sick wife, Lloyd's mom, the real Eve, while pretending to join Geek to restore his creation, the robot Eve, who swears in this book which is unrelated but really funny to me. Honoring the tradition of not so great fathers the mother series, Distorto even felt contempt towards his son this whole time, because he always saw Lloyd as a coward with no willpower, so Lloyd feels understandably indifferent about whether or not they'll meet again. Getting back to Lloyd's artificial mother, Eve directly challenges the cosmic invader in combat, but this titan's courage is tragically met with a body-piercing laser that brings her to ruin. It's certainly not all for nothing though, as from within the wreckage, a final melody begins to play. Adding far more elaboration than what was provided in the game, Geek's birth mother is actually a major character in this story, and she was good friends with Nintendo's great-grandparents having presumably abducted his great-grandfather George and great-grandmother Maria as samples for some kind of experimentation, she was surprised to find a species of lesser psi on the remote planet Earth, and became more interested in learning about them as people. Geek's mother and Maria soon formed a deep connection and friendship with one another, because they were both expecting and felt comfort in the idea of being mothers together. This was not meant to be though, as some urgent incoming disaster, translator Niasu decided to specify as being a comet, was heading towards Earth at the same time Maria started having contractions. Knowing it was the only way to save them, the alien mother used self-destructive Psy to stop the comet, sacrificing herself for the future of Maria's child. In return, Maria promised to incubate Geek's egg and raise him like her own but the baby's scheduled to hatch in about 150 human years, so Maria has to use a type of time capsule that runs on psi power aboard the mothership to watch over the egg until he's born. Maria decided to stay on the ship and enter the time capsule, while George brought their own newborn baby back home on Earth, and started researching the secrets of Psy, in preparation for the inevitable day more visitors like Geek will come again, in hopes that he can reunite with his wife one day. For the rest of George's lifetime, however, no other extraterrestrials presented themselves, and Psy remained an unsolvable enigma. Maria's plan didn't quite work either, due to the time capsule either being incompatible with humans, or the Earth's ever-changing climate. The strong Psy field on Geek's ship eventually caused Maria to be reborn as Queen Mary, who created the sickly sweet realm of Magicant as a sort of baby's nursery. But Geek hatched into our world and Queen Mary had no recollection of her time as Maria, so there was no one to watch over him, with a certain fractured nostalgic song keeping the two separated. Singing the restored eight melodies is the only way for Queen Mary to regain her memories of being human, which eventually allows her to re-establish a connection with the life form she loves so dearly, as they embrace and fly away in the starship to wherever Geek's birth mother is. Geek and Maria's conclusion was satisfyingly heartrending, but this is Dark Aspects, so we must undo that pretty bow because sadly I'm not leaving things wrapped up so nicely. My final talking point for today then, is perhaps the weirdest thing I've ever had to talk about on the channel, which the author also saved for last so don't blame me. That is to say, the closing few sentences of the novel. I want you to read these along with me, and think about how it all sounds without context. Anna nodded with powerful enthusiasm while subconsciously, she gently stroked her lower belly. And somehow, her smile was not unlike that of Queen Mary. At the foot of the mountain, even the cherry blossoms were already blooming. Alright, I have three explanations for this. Firstly, and this is how I interpreted the meaning, is that this is purely symbolic. Throughout the novel, there's an underlying theme of Anna realizing just how amazing mothers are, and that she'd likely make for a wonderful parent one day. 
It's mentioned several times that she possesses an innate motherly instinct, and is described as being exactly alike Queen Mary, said to be the essence of all mothers combined in some ways. I think it'd make some sense for Anna to be rubbing the area around her navel, that's how it's directly worded in Japanese, as an odd way of foreshadowing her future destiny as a mother, while she's subconsciously thinking of what just happened with Maria and Gig finally being at peace. The second explanation is the obvious, albeit upsetting one, where the line is taken literally. While we're never outright told anything obscene like that happened in the story, there was that hallucinogenic sequence with the cavern water, and would, if something unmentionable happened we weren't told about, unfortunately imply that Ken is the father. It's worth noting that in a previous chapter, there was focus on Lloyd and Anna being mistaken for a couple, while they were both picking up supplies at a supermarket while carrying Noel. A stranger tells them, Good for you, youngins. Go on, go on, keep at it. Romeo and Juliet were in their early teens too, you know, and we can't lose to the Europeans. This reaction inspired Lloyd to start talking about certain passionate feelings of love, as well as the intense urges particular to puberty. Note that this was the censored line by Nyasu. Lloyd says intense sexual urges specifically in the original Japanese version. Anna is flustered by their conversation, and confides in Ken about it, who in turn gets embarrassed and turns red. This causes Anna to feel relieved, but also curiously lonely and disappointed. So she then responds with a deliberately wanton air, which is suspicious behavior for a 12 year old girl. She was corrupted by that rock and roll music, I tell ya. If this wasn't Kumi's intention, and I hope it wasn't, I'm just going to pretend that Queen Mary gifted Anna a child in the spirit of the Virgin Mary. Rest assured, if Nyasu is ever given the opportunity to meet the author, she will ask, what did you mean by that please? With all that said, I hope I didn't just discourage you from reading or enjoying the book, because my thoughts about it are overall very positive. I had an absolute blast reading Saori Kumi's Mother, and I do recommend her story as a compliment to the original. So does Shikasato Itoi, as it's presented by him. I personally love the descriptions of Sai, like Anna first realizing her offensive powers by acting as a lightning rod to the vast, untamed, powerful flow of energy circling the universe, collecting it. I'm also a big fan of all the little moments Kumi wrote in that successfully feel very mother-like, such as the characters breaking the fourth wall a bit by critiquing Ken as he's describing Magicant, asking why he suddenly changed genres from sci-fi to fantasy. Then there's the subtle ways in which Kumi referenced the games, such as Geek's inexplicable attack being a flash of something like red lightning, which somehow creates a pain in the kids' throats, while thinning the air around them as an attempt to stop their singing. Next time, I'm going to be diving into the arguably superior sequel novel, which is guaranteed to baffle any Earthbound fan. Winter 2021. On December 25th, 2021, literally Christmas Day, I first discovered that someone had translated both official mother novels into English. My mind was blown as if a New Year's Eve bomb had just detonated five days early. That month was a crazy time for me. My wife and I did the most traveling we've ever done in our entire lives as part of some runaway road trip, where we drove cross country from Arizona to West Virginia, where I researched the Flatwoods monster that inspired them from The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask as part of another Dark Aspect series, then from the Mountain State to the Green Mountain State of Vermont to see her mom. After driving back home, we immediately flew out to Hawaii and back to visit my dad then finally headed east to Texas so we could spend Christmas with another side of the family. I know that sounds absolutely insane, and it kind of is, but what we didn't anticipate is getting stranded at my father-in-law's place due to some carefree guy hitting our parked car and bolting without leaving a note. The plan was to leave on the 26th, but with the front end bashed in and numerous problems now under the hood of our only way home, we had no choice but to wait on repairs after we finally found a mechanic who would take us during the holidays. The car was ready to roll again on New Year's Eve, evening. I kid you not, we experienced multiple fireworks shows that night driving because of the time zone change setting us back an hour, but that still left us with five days with nothing to do. It was actually a bit of a blessing in disguise, besides the fact that our insurance doesn't cover a hit and run, since I could now dedicate all of my precious time reading these novels while my wife replayed Okami. 
The question for me was, which one? Mother, the original story, or Mother 2, Gigas Strikes Back? And since I know I'll get some comments, yes, I say Gigas, not Gigas, or Gigagas for a reason. See here for more details. Honestly, I had gleaned over Kenny Sue's newer translation of the first book and enjoyed what I read. But comparatively, I hadn't heard anything about the Earthbound story besides how wild it gets. Thanks to the sample live reading of Chewie's translation from the 2013 Earthbound Bash, a handful of short descriptions on Earthbound Central, and some fan art circulating online. Luckily, much like playing Earthbound before Beginnings, you're not losing much of anything as they are two separate stories with little holding them together. However, whether that mattered or not was thrown out the window once Pokey Minch, a 14-year-old without a license or even a permit, started drifting in his father's Ferrari and ditched the luxury car as soon as he spotted the police, then suggested that Ness take the blame. With my transcendent life, I shall see this story through to its end, I thought, as I proceeded to read and read and read some more until I finished on December 29th. I've since reread the book so I could take notes and soak things in a second time, keeping the experience fresh in my mind as I write this script. Those initial four days of reading this thing for the first time with my undivided attention though is an irreplaceable memory I will forever cherish. And let me tell you, there are some story developments here that still shake me to my core. So if you have any interest in reading them spoiler free, this is your last chance to jump ship swim to port, then crack open that laptop at the nearest Stoic Club with free Wi-Fi and get reading. Otherwise, grab onto your sandals because we're sailing straight towards the dark aspects in this kraken of a story. Something that should be of interest to fans comes up almost immediately with the introduction of Ness's father. While these paragraphs of new information about him don't outright deny the possibility that he's literally a phone, it's unfortunately very likely the dude is of flesh and bone, which is quite the revelation. Ness's mom, with her reportedly ample bosom, was a supermodel in her younger days, and his dad an important businessman working for Aloysius Minch, who owns the Minch supermarket chain. While working for the man, Ness's father had a little side project perfecting the ultimate hamburger for his son with an incredibly picky palate. That's right, Ness's favorite food in this interpretation is hamburgers, not Salisbury steak, and he has standards, which means trash burgers may be out of the question. Through hard work in trial and error, Ness's papa successfully created the world's most delicious hamburger that even his fussy son wouldn't be able to resist. A delicacy he aptly called Ness Burger. It was a big hit, so he founded a new restaurant chain that shares its name with its most popular menu item. Like if the Big Mac at McDonald's was also named McDonald's, using stocks of meat he'd bought up from Mr. Minch's stores. When Ness Burger was founded, Ness's father had been assertively given a loan by Pokey's dad. A nice way of providing context for the $100,000 or more, which is actually something like a hundred million jillion dollars in Japanese he supposedly borrowed from Aloysius. In the novel, Mr. Minch put together an underhanded binding contract under the pretense of goodwill, which Ness's dad mistakenly signed on to, and now has the lion's share of his profits and reputation siphoned directly to Mr. Minch. The seedy agreement he's bound to forces Minch Market advertisements to be printed all over the wrappers at Ness Burger, because Aloysius now has complete control over management and advertising decisions too. In an interesting twist, Mr. Minch is actually the reason Ness's father is absent from his son's life. In his anger, after failing to steal the Krabby Patty secret formula, the world's worst boss sent his wage slave to work overseas to keep him away from home, and eventually break the man in hopes that he'll spill the beans about his secret recipe. Basically, Ness's father skimmed the terms and conditions of the contract and inadvertently agreed to sign his life away to an old friend who turned out to be a sordid old pig. Mr. Minch even creepily has the hots for Ness's mom, offering to take her out to dinner at a high-class restaurant his father couldn't afford. His master plan involves using lower-quality meat to tarnish the Ness Burger name, in order to dispirit Ness's old man so much that he quits. Then, he'll take over the restaurant's charmingly renamed Pokey Burger and restore sales to the highs they once reached. Aloysius is a conceited, manipulative shell of a man, but little does he know that his eldest son is about to unintentionally surpass his wickedness. You see, Pokey actually witnessed firsthand the infamous meteorite crashing on Mount Onet. Recklessly driving that aforementioned Ferrari with Picky in tow, the meteorite fragmented when it touched down on Earth and sent shards slamming into the windshield. 
The ground beneath him started violently shaking, so Pokey abruptly turned the wheel and Picky was thrown out of the vehicle. A large piece of the comet then tore into the roof, and Pokey let out a terrible scream as it burst into light, so Picky thought the car had exploded in flames. When Ness first encountered Picky, he worriedly questioned if his older brother was still alive because he had already presumed the worst. A cold chill was sent down Ness's spine as Picky asked if he seemed like the same brother he'd always known, the real Pokey. This is the first major red flag that something is seriously very wrong, but Ness and Picky brush off his story and skepticism as a hallucination dreamt up when he passed out earlier. As Ness escorts the youngest Minch brother home, the Psy tutorial boss Starman Jr. makes his grand entrance disguised as Pokey. The alien menace puts his hands on his hips and laughs, which reminded me of the Mecha Porky sprites from Mother 3. The psychedelic battle background of the game is then amazingly contextualized in this story as the world wraps around our combatants and the atmosphere becomes heavy, with intense, sinister waves beginning to swell from the spaceman. I think even more so than the previous novel, this story does a fantastic job of recreating the feeling of turn-based RPG battles. After the Starman Jr. is evaporated thanks to everyone's favorite rhinoceros beetle, Buzz Buzz, who's a scientist of the future in this novel, serving the same purpose as his game counterpart, the meteorite is revealed to be an egg for a certain cosmic monster, Gigas. The intergalactic fiend used it to cross through space and time, hatching as soon as he arrived on Mount Onet. Nobody, not even Buzz Buzz, knows what Gigas' larval state looks like. But the intellectual insect is aware that the newly hatched Gigas will have assumed the form of your typical, average, everyday human being, likely having taken anyone who happened to be nearby as a host, which very unluckily turns out to be Ness's next door neighbor, Pokey. Buzz Buzz goes on to explain that Gigas will grow inside the belly of the person he chose to carry him, controlling them from within via waves of evil influence that will also spread out into the surrounding environment. It's said that because Pokey already possessed a destructive personality before his little miracle, he will more easily mold into Gigas' puppet. Pokey's fate, then, is to allow this parasite to grow in his belly over the course of about half a year, until Gigas eats through him and the inexplicable monster emerges. Ness realizes right away that his old friend has become the mother to this abomination, and Buzz Buzz tasks the boy with eliminating him before Gigas is born, which, yes, sounds like that infamous Earthbound fan theory I will not acknowledge any further. Ness has the opportunity to dispatch his frenemy very early on in the story, but instinctively hesitates because of their shared history. Before Buzz Buzz prepares to do the dirty deed himself, Lardna mistakes him for a dung beetle, then a cockroach, as she smashes his guts out with a slipper. From here on out, all other aliens, like the hideous, odious Master Belch, refer to Pokey as Gigas, which Pokey assumes means something like leader or god in their language, so it doesn't bother him. Since Pokey is in essence pregnant with an eldritch horror, that's a sentence I never thought I'd say, he inhumanly increases in size throughout the novel to a disturbing degree. Aloysius compares his condition to when Lardna was expecting Pokey, but this is no normal maternal weight gain, as Pokey, an already bigger kid to begin with, amasses an obscenely unnatural amount of fat in a short period of time. The description of his heaviness becomes truly disconcerting when his eyes and nose sink into his swollen cheeks, and every step brings him pain as his inflamed body chafes and works to shorten his breath. His face sags with countless folds of extra skin burying his neck. His fingers are described as fat, round little caterpillars that are later mistaken for sausages by some hungry river fish, and his fingers are capable of bending the metal support in the armrest of his chair like putty. It's so bad that eventually the narrator has to simply start referring to Pokey as the fleshy mass. Towards the end of the book, there aren't any clothes that will fit him anymore, so he opts to wear two bath towels, amusingly adorned with Miffy Bunny, as an unsuccessful attempt to cover his massive body. During his transformation from portly to abnormally obese, his bloodshot red eyes begin bulging and his eyelids fitfully twitching as he stares off without focus. Midway through the story, Pokey inhales a can of cola until he chokes, which sends him into a coughing fit as his whole body falls into rhythmic shock. 
The veins in his neck swell and retract. His drooling mouth hangs open in anguish, while tears and sweat stream down his face. This book had me feeling bad for the most twisted troublemaking boy ever, which is quite the accomplishment. Pity for the same tainted soul that would go on to commit unredeemable acts of malice in the sequel game. It's a confusing feeling reminiscent of Mother 3's ending, where he locks himself into a fate worse than death. Pokey is not just a snot-nosed brat with a dark side in this novel, like he is in Earthbound. Gigas did clearly corrupt him in that game by amplifying his negative qualities, but there were no physical ramifications, besides perhaps his skin turning blue, unless he simply appeared that way inside of the spider mech through the glass. Regardless, that is not the case here, as Pokey's aforementioned ever-bulging body puts him through hell. He develops a ravenous hunger, too going as far as to eat a live, still wriggling fish in a daze as he promises to slaughter Ness, smiling with its blood smeared around the edges of his mouth. This unhinged behavior is a result of the Gigas larva festering inside of him, but there's another key to his amoral spiral, and perhaps why he's been able to survive, a primitive human effigy called the Mani Mani, sent by Gigas to help protect his host. This devil statue played a large part in Earthbound, it was first unearthed by treasure hunter Liar Exaggerate, but only really became a problem when it was sold to a gentleman known as Mr. Carpainter. Welcome to Happy Happy Village, home to insane cultists unhappy with the vibrance and varied hues of the world, following the crazed Mr. Carpainter and his decree that everything in the world shall be blue. It's both hilarious and uncanny, which is honestly a decent descriptor for most of the Earthbound experience in general. The game never really gave us a reason why this zealot took the lyrics of that Eiffel 65 song as scripture, other than him stating that the Mani Mani statue made him do peculiar things. It was instead Monotoli who gave us the most detailed information about how the statue works, explaining that it traps anyone under its influence inside an illusion it creates. The statue attracts wicked spirits that weaken the heart of its user, but also grants them an evil power. We learn through gameplay that the thing is sentient too, as it attacks with Psy and can even neutralize its effects on the battlefield. The novel thankfully gives us even more to chew on, naming the notorious glorious light it emits the Super Aura. Carpainter uses the statue here to suffocate his followers in inordinate, euphoric blue-colored waves that make them convulse and or scream with their eyes wide open. The relic is an invaluable treasure coveted by black market traders, prophesied to lead the people astray and drown them in captivating greed. It appears to perpetually heighten a person's desires, but Ness comes to understand later that it's simply a device fully exposing a person's truest potential, allowing them to perform at their highest possible limit. While the game never really gave us a sensical reason for Mr. Carpenter's obsession with the color blue specifically, the novel actually provides him with a backstory that explains how and why Happy Happyism was founded. When the cult leader was just a boy, he was very thin and sickly, having to take medication daily, with the nasty side effect of turning his face into a zombie-like blue color. His appearance and innate awkwardness scared off any potential friends, which left him so very alone. To cope with the isolation, and to express his emotions, he became a painter, using only the color blue in his artwork to match his altered skin. His style began attracting those who were lost like him, those who could sympathize with his melancholy. Happy Happy Village, then, was conceived as a place where all who were troubled could live together in peace, but the Mani Mani distorted the innocent wish into a delusionary desire to conquer all and kidnap a certain special girl with psychokinetic powers to recruit as his own personal channeler, or high priestess in Earthbound. After not letting that happen by disbanding the Unholy Communion, Ness and Paula find themselves in another dire predicament when they take the trip to Threed. Paula nearly faints at the sight of some vile, unknown evil peering at them through the graveyard as they try to find a place they can spend the night. In bright neon letters, Hotel Threed, briefly flickering to read Hell, brings Ness both relief and worry, but Paula's alarming condition overrides his superstitious fear. He ultimately checks into the totally not haunted hotel, assisted by a woman reminding him of Morticia Adams, and who seems to glide across the floor. This reads exactly like the opening of Luigi's Mansion 3 to me, with Helen gravely welcoming the unlucky hero and his friends to the last resort. This otherworldly lady, of course, is the mysterious zombie woman from Earthbound, shutting the two inside of room 237, probably. An exceedingly filthy chamber, blanketed in numerous layers of moldy dust kicked up with each step, like Mother 3's dirty cafe. 
Pokey taunts them from behind the locked door, but thankfully a new ally is coming, the boy genius Jeff Andonuts, who gets an entire chapter dedicated to him. Chapter 4, Meeting Up With Jeff Emphasis on the exclamation point sounds playful and innocuous, but it's actually the part of the story I would recommend to anyone who felt that Mother 2 should have had more heart-rending moments like 3. Abbott, stay down! Stay down, Abbott! <laughs> no! Stay down! That might be confusing to hear, because we aren't told about anything overtly tragic happening to him in the game. Besides, you know, Jeff's father sending the boy off to boarding school and not visiting him for 10 years or so. But the novel shakes things up by debuting a new character, Jack Andonuts, as Jeff's older sibling. He's introduced as Jeff's beloved older brother, so what could possibly go wrong? This version of Jeff has two handicapped legs fitted with heavy metal support bracers. He self-deprecatingly compares himself to Frankenstein, even though he means Frankenstein's monster, as he drags his leaden legs across the floor, but is determined to save a pair of friends he's never met, answering Paula's telepathic distress call even if it means crossing the ocean to do so. Since he'd have great trouble treading through the dense snow of winters, his schoolmates prepare a <clears throat> trusty hyper wheelchair that once belonged to the dormitory leader, the Great Hawking. Yep, this beauty is a spiked six-wheeled snowmobile slash off-road bike hybrid powered by a solar battery. When he eventually, and just barely, makes the arduous trip to his father's laboratory, the boy is given prosthetic legs via surgery performed by a literal troglodyte. Jeff is injected with a sedative and falls into a deep sleep, notably apologizing to his father repeatedly. As you could probably guess, it is now time for the big sad, told through a flashback while Jeff is out cold. When he was a very young boy, he traveled with his father, his mother, and his dear brother to a resort for a vacation. That night, the boys stuffed themselves at a seafood restaurant on the harbor, finishing well before their parents, who weren't even done with their drinks. Romance was in the air, so Jack had the foresight to take Jeff and leave their parents to enjoy each other's company, suggesting that the two brothers check out the cruiser boat parked by the pier. The friendly ship captain invited the two on board for a tour, and Jack was especially ecstatic as boats were his hobby. He started a deep conversation with the crew, while Jeff was groaning in boredom and thought to slip away while no one was taking notice. He darted outside onto the deck and realized that while the back of the ship was filled with party goers, the front was empty, so he decided to explore it. At the very tip of the ship's bow, there was a metal fitting in the shape of a ring fastened to it, used to moor the boat. Wanting to try tying a sailor's knot to this ring, Jeff pulled out the cord from the waistline of his parka and threaded it through. When his knot came out poorly, Jeff tried again using the strings from his hood, which of course resulted in him getting helplessly caught as he pulled the knotted cord together too tightly. As the ship prepared to dock, the crew began unraveling the mooring rope and lifting the anchor. Jack stepped outside to see his younger brother tangled in a mess of too tight twine even he couldn't undo, as he hurriedly ran to get help. The captain spotted the two boys towards the bow, which was supposed to be clear, and yelled out orders to the helmsman, who couldn't hear because of the cacophony of the orchestra and nearby fireworks being set off. The engine reverberated as the boat abruptly veered and rocked violently. This freed Jeff, though it sent him sliding across the deck and nearly overboard. Jack managed to catch him with one arm and the two landed on the dock, but the 3,000 ton cruiser came swinging back their way and crushed Jeff's legs between it and the beams of the dock. Jeff just about deafened himself with the sound of his own screams, while he stared into the eyes of his brother and watched the light fade from them as a streak of blood trickled down his lifeless body. Dr. Andonut's hair turned white overnight, while his wife collapsed to the floor in tears. Jack had been killed at just 15 years old. After the funeral, Jeff went to live at the dormitory while his parents divorced. Their family was broken, as they couldn't continue living together without being reminded of what had happened. This is the novel's reason for why Jeff hasn't seen his father in years. His dad paid for his tuition, but hasn't otherwise reached out. Waiting for his father to at least send out a Christmas card, Jeff would write one to himself every holiday when it never came. After all these years though, the man clearly doesn't hate his youngest son. He tends to his wounds and aids Jeff on his quest by preparing the Flying Skyrunner so that he may finally rescue his soon-to-be companions from their imprisonment, that hotel room they've been confined in for over 24 hours. Just as Ness and Paula begin bickering about the bathroom situation, i.e. the lack thereof, Jeff comes to save the day by crashing through the ceiling. 
When we last saw Pokey, he wished for Ness to go ahead and starve, panic, and piss himself to death before leaving. But he also mentioned a revolting creature from outer space named Belch, leader of the undead threat in Threed. In Pokey's own words, because Belch can use the force or whatever, these ghouls are rising from their graves and wreaking havoc. Belch, the big old pile of barf, is pretty gnarly and earthbound, but the adjectives of the novel do wonders in painting an even more nauseating picture. This Belch possesses hidden tentacles on his body, he can tear off pieces of himself to throw around, and is even able to spew acidic liquid that can melt people into a puddle of syrupy goop. True to his original character, the putrid puke demands fly honey, an out of this world treat that can't otherwise be found on this planet, as flies thankfully don't make honey on Earth. But he insists on sensing its foulness somewhere nearby. The newly formed trio has to stop Belch, so the inhabitants of this town and the neighboring Saturn Valley can see the sunlight again. The people of Threed have also had their homes overtaken by evil spirits, like the zombie hotel owner, who are tormenting the innocents by causing blood to spray out of faucets, and apparently teaching T-bone steaks how to walk, all while Belch wallows in his own filth. Before Jeff and Apple Kid invent a temporary solution by drawing in and then trapping all of the zombies in the resident circus tent, the gang departs the departed, and stumbles upon the very last place you'd ever find me. As someone with contamination OCD, a hive containing ten of thousands of festering flies producing that rotten snack coveted by Belch. The myriad of flies are able to form into different shapes like a skull and crossbones, which reminded me of those annoying barricading bees from Yoshi's story. Nevertheless, the curious Jeff scoops up a sample and braces his nose for a showdown with a vomitous villain. Much like his role in the game, Master Belch enslaves the innocent alien race of Mr. Saturns to work in his factory. In the book, his base was converted into a sweatshop slash karaoke bar from a hydroelectric dam, and we're actually shown firsthand how cruelly he treats the Mr. Saturns when he mercilessly whips them by extending his pliable self. Thankfully, our heroes put a stop to this abuse by smacking that jar of fly honey straight into his face as an appetizer, then feeding him a main course of dry ice, PK freeze, and Jeff's super cooling gun to put him on ice. Besides those I've already mentioned, there are plenty more beefed up baddies and bosses throughout the journey. This includes Frank and his street gang, the Sharks, who nearly beat Ness to death. Seriously, their violence has been cranked up to 11. And the Kraken, a sea serpent Pokey picked out from a catalog as recommended by a Starman Super. It's just like the NME sales guy pitching lowly monsters to DDD from Kirby right back at ya so he can clobber that dare Kirby. Apparently, the Kraken in this interpretation is a studious creature who's been closely following human politics and has his own stance on the subject of gun control. Now that line reads just like dialogue from the game. As an aside, the book is filled with so many fittingly ridiculous moments like that, so if you ask me, I think that for the most part, the author really nailed Shigesato Itoi's tone. This isn't always the case, however, as I'll elaborate on in a bit with the owner of the Stoic Club. The real malevolence of this story, the Mani Mani, makes its grand return in Foreside as the Bio Ness Burger is rolled out by the Big Mean Minch. It's an exclusive menu item in the big city that's so powerfully addictive it causes consumers to become uncontrollably chaotic and aggressive, an impulse that only temporarily subsides as they wolf down more. The voracious demand for these burgers is responsible for traffic accidents, physical assault, and theft as hordes of hands push and shove their way to these bioengineered burgers that can be swallowed down in huge quantities without satiating anyone. The crowd eventually becomes an undulating mass of zombie-like junkies described as looking like a huge battleship on the water. They eat these lab-made burgers with a glazed look in their eye, devouring mountainous piles of food until they collapse in exhaustion and beg for an ambulance. Some of these victims to the Bioness burger are none other than the entirety of the Runaway Five band. Jeff deduces that everyone's insatiable appetite is a result of the Bio Burger altering their minds, so he's able to reverse the Runaway's rapacious cravings with the power of placebo. As it turns out, the burgers were laced with water exposed to recreations of the evil Mani Mani idol, nicknamed Mini Mini Mani Manis, so when Ness and company are ambushed by Pokey with his army of brainwashed wrestlers and karate masters, remember that part from the game? He uses Psy to melt and mangle one of the statuettes in his hands, which is revealed to have been made from the meteor right that crash landed on Onet. This frees all affected in the vicinity from their stupor, as if they'd been exercised of some kind of demon. 
Mr. Monatoli was one of these people, who promptly had his security guards retrieve the rest of the mini statues so that Ness could destroy them and save the city. Those who had severely damaged their stomachs or were injured by the drove of crazed gourmets were rushed to a hospital for recovery. Earlier on in the book, there's an amazing line from the Tucson doctor that cured Ness from his mushroomization where he tells the kids that they should be careful and starts listing off dangerous things to look out for. Monsters, wild beasts, strange weather, perverts, scoundrels, a dungeon man. I laughed pretty hard at this, but he was serious, as that problematic club owner I mentioned before is a pervert who introduces himself to Ness, a 12-year-old in an uncomfortable, inappropriate manner when the trio arrive at Summers. Thankfully, nothing more comes of this, but yeesh is what I have to say on the matter. While Paula accidentally gets drunk on champagne in their luxurious hotel suite and passes out while cocooned in the bedspread, yes, that actually happens, Ness and Jeff are left to brave the creep secret society to try and win back a ship captain's boat, which was lost in a bet. While the Stoic Club is still a private club for esteemed individuals to drink nothing but mineral water, the novel version is an undisclosed association under the ocean, reserved for the rich elite who have already crossed off everything on their bucket lists. These aristocrats have become depressed with nothing really left to live for, though the public spotlight still shines on them. Rather than intellectuals philosophizing over the inevitable collapse of capitalism, the Stoic Club here acts as a refuge for these superstars to do nothing and be boring without judgment. According to the owner, this brings them happiness, but the waiter also darkly mentions that their members often request poisoned water, which he refuses to serve, hinting that plenty of them have already attempted suicide. Jeff is tricked into downing one of these supposedly drugged drinks in a game of Russian roulette and faints, entering what I initially interpreted to be something like his own magicant. Ness and eventually a sober Paula, along with Pooh, the last of the chosen four they haven't met yet, use some kind of psi astral projection to follow and enter what I thought to be Jeff's headspace. I'll reveal what it actually is later. Here, they witness the troubled boy finally making peace with his deceased brother. When Jack removes a likely metaphorical rope, literally materialized in this ethereal realm, hanging around Jeff's neck. This mystifying near-death experience conveniently allows Jeff to overcome his fear of large boats, and saves face in regard to the Stoic Club owner's carelessness via almost murdering a child. The server didn't actually lace the waters with anything but lemon, but the owner didn't know that at the time. Having snapped the culpable man out of his funk, the children, which will soon include Pooh, PK teleporting himself to the scene in real time, score that ship so they can sail to Scaraba. Following a sad, familiar story about natives losing their land and homes to foreign settlers, then being forced to acclimate to a new way of life, we learn that Pokey and his father crash-landed their helicopter in the jungle due to Pokey suddenly growing in size again like Kirby eating that 200th strawberry in Dream Buffet. The dastardly duo had to dump all of the cash they made from their exploits in Tucson and Foreside to try and match the weight limit again. But it was fruitless, as they're now stranded in the aforementioned village that's since been abandoned due to its people relocating. The Mani Mani statue had already been surfacing Aloysius' obsession with money, to the point where he cared more about future earnings than his son suddenly collapsing onto the floor in a previous chapter. But now that he's completely without his fortune, the man has gone certifiably insane. He skips meals to fanatically cut palm fronds down to the size and shape of dollar bills, then carefully counts them as if they were real currency. Pokey's even worried enough to tell him to eat, but his father is so entranced by his delusions that he continues on and on until ultimately he starves to death. You heard that right. Pokey uses a bent steel plate from the helicopter as a makeshift grave, inscribing the following. Aloysius Minch, 1943 to 1994. See you in hell, you scrawny, greedy bastard! That means there will be no visiting the man drinking his sorrows away at Jackie's Cafe when the war against Gigas is over. Aloysius Minch is dead. This is also around the time we learn that, surprise, Aloysius was never the greatest father, even before the Mani Mani's influence. Ness's dad was actually more of a father figure to Pokey, and so the two boys spent a lot of time together as if he were a member of their family. However, with Pokey being two years older than Ness, these friends couldn't go to school together, which meant Pokey was left alone to be callously bullied by his peers. Aloysius only did what he knew best, and spent money, rather than time, on his kid. So Pokey resorted to stuffing his face to fill that hole in his heart, which ultimately made the situation worse. 
As Pokey gained weight and stopped studying, classmates were given more ammunition. The fear and anxiety he once felt upon being mocked soon turned to seething hatred for everyone around him, and he became violent because he could, as Aloysius would again just throw money at the problem and cover his misbehaving son whenever he injured somebody. Pokey quickly became the most despised kid on the block by his contemporaries, so Ness eventually stopped playing with him too, ignoring his old friend as if he didn't exist. Pokey's just a dumb pig after all. Yeah, a pig. Piggy Pokey. Pokey Pork. I bet they sell that in family size packs at your father's supermarket. These specific cruel words from his bullies really work to set up Pokey's fixation on pigs in Mother 3, when he learns to embrace the hatred so that he can redirect it to make everyone else suffer under the oppressive rule of his pig-themed empire. I do really wish there was a third novel now, but as you'll see, the ending of this book, along with other factors Saori Kumi herself outlines here, would have made adapting the third game tricky anyway. During an incident where Pokey failed to flip over a vault bar in front of his tormentors, and Ness, who he considered to be a little brother, they all ran over to kick the poor kid while he was down. Ness didn't know what to do. Should he act with courage and face this gang of bullies, who were all older than he was? Pokey glared at Ness with a look of complete disdain, and in a panic, the young Ness chose flight. He shut his eyes and ran away, proof that their friendship had truly torn apart. At that moment, Pokey had vowed to never ever forgive Ness. Suppressing that memory for now, the Chosen Four learn that they must transplant their brain programs, aka spirits, into robots to fight Gigas, who's preparing for his birth in the rift between the dimensions. In the game, Dr. Andonuts offers the modest explanation that the phase distorter machine they must use to confront him cannot warp life forms because life is demolished in the time travel process. In the book, both the Great Talking Rock of the Lost Underworld and a Starman Super are given the role instead, elaborating further by explaining that living things cannot pass through the rift in time, because beyond the rift, all time exists in chaos, from the first breath of life in the universe to its inevitable death in eternal darkness. The vortexes in time would instantly squeeze out all of the cells in one's body, annihilating them completely. The book also gives us insight as to why the Mr. Saturns are on Earth. A strange whirlwind overtook their interstellar craft, along with reasoning for why our ancient ancestors and cryptids like Tessie are currently coexisting with modern humankind. The answer to the latter lies beyond space and time, which is where the four can now go in that newly invented phase distorter. Pokey and Gigas are not on this planet anymore. They're not in this galaxy, nor are they even in this timeline. Once Gigas is born, he can assume his complete form and conquer over the entire universe, which includes all of time and space. Tragically, albeit hilariously, the Starman Super knows he's just a pawn to Gigas, but has an elderly mother, a sickly wife, and three starving children back home all waiting for him to send them his paycheck. When Ness and his friends hear the news that their living bodies must be thrown away so that their souls can be transferred into robots to survive the journey, we're given a painfully despondent exchange between Ness and Paula about the future they'll have to give up for the sake of the world. Ness, having decided to endure the mission alone, tries to take in the beauty of his surroundings one final time, but Paula and the others will not let him go solo, of course. Like a four-leaf clover, their destinies are inseparable as equal parts to a whole. Disturbingly, only a couple of pages later, we're filled in on the actual details of their surgery, rather than them lying down in a dark room while the screen flashes to the sound of a drill machine. The good doctor has a plan to cryopreserve their bodies once the souls have been successfully removed. Luckily, the Mr. Saturns have a thorough understanding of what a soul actually is and how it works, but they all have trouble explaining it in terms a human would understand. Pooh and his inborn spirituality are also instrumental to the transferring process, because having a god residing in him, oh did I not mention that yet, he's able to pass into the realm of the dead, which they've been to before, as the place I mistook for Jeff's magic ant. So yes, Jeff was genuinely visited by his brother from heaven then. Some Mr. Saturns put on surgical masks. Imagine this being the last thing you see before being put under the knife. And raise their gloved hands. Yep, they've got hands in this novel too. 
then give the kids an injection, while the air fills with nitrous oxide. The Mr. Saturn-shaped space-time transporter seems to work sort of like the time machine from H.G. Wells' fiction, in that it floats in place as a center point while the universe flows past it, until the newly roboticized heroes pass through three-dimensional space and land inside the center of the Earth, which is where Ness's final Your Sanctuary is located. The rift in time they enter is apparently where all timelines in multiple dimensions converge to perish and be reborn, where all meaning in the universe can be found. This is where the legendary carbon-slash-diamond dog boss is fought, but rather than it being a long and grueling battle, Ness the robot just kind of points his metallic finger in the air and obliterates it in mere seconds with more power than he meant to use. With that show of strength, Pooh reveals that Ness has become a master, as if he had maxed out his stats in an RPG. When Ness records the melody of the Fire Spring, he finally accesses his magic hand, which plays out just like it does in the game at first, but then goes horribly wrong, as it focuses on what was only a minor part of Ness's dream world in the game, Pokey. The two ex-friends drift through the cosmos together and begin to talk things out, but Pokey refuses to believe that Ness ever actually liked him. So in this dreamscape, he transports the both of them to that fateful day on the school playground with a vault bar. Ness watches his child self run away from the abused Pokey, as the memory loops again and again while his guilt manifests as a giant Pokey incessantly shouting what Ness did wrong. The bullying progresses to a deranged degree, as Ness tries to do what he didn't then and stop them, but it's too late, as the light leaves Pokey's eyes and suddenly, a nightmare sequence rears its ugly head. The sun bursts, the earth trembles, and the sky shatters as a shower of blood gushes out of the older kids. A vortex of swirling black clouds appear and lightning strikes the schoolhouse, as windows smash and the building crumbles while children fall to the ground or are swept up in a whirlwind. One child's limbs are ripped off and blown apart, while another's face is savagely torn away. It hurts! A little boy cries as his entrails hang out from his stomach. Quote unquote fun fact. In Earthbound, that same haunting line of dialogue from Gigas' final battle was actually directly inspired by a traffic accident series creator Shikasato Itoi witnessed firsthand a long time ago. Back then, he saw a young woman lying on the ground, and instead of saying, I can't breathe or help, she just cried out, it hurts. This really disturbed him. So the line was included because he thought it'd make the player reluctant to attack Gigas, even though he's the enemy. This particular M-rated horror does not cease until the reason behind these horrible visions is destroyed, the original Mani Mani, as it takes on the form of Ness. Using PK Rockin to utterly destroy the Golden Relic for good, its ultimate illusion dissipates, and Ness wakes up to another round of horror, although it isn't gory this time. Ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived at the final battle, a showdown between the robotic Ness and his metal friends against the colossal Pokey from before, except he's even bigger now, and stark naked. His insurmountably obese body is described as a fleshy pink wall before them, verified by Pooh as he pokes the puffed up tower of Pokey and it jiggles profusely. His belly is so swollen it looks as if he had swallowed the moon. That inflated, stiffened body has become more reminiscent of a Marysville slash Thanksgiving Day Parade float than a human being. Enraged over the destruction of his beloved Mani Mani, Pokey begins thrashing about with his unbendable arms and legs as the reality around them begins to wobble and distort. Suddenly, the pink wall that makes up Pokey stretches to close the heroes in from all sides, like a padded cell meant to contain otherwise unrestrainable prisoners. The floor, ceiling, and walls, all part of this boundless Pokey, bounce our heroes around like tin toy robots on a trampoline. All of their moves, from Psy to Bottle Rockets, bounce off the bloated blubber to no effect, while Pokey cackles and his flesh undulates. Pokey then begins to contort himself, sending his enemies crashing together as he squeezes his skin to crush them. The Chosen Four's metal bodies are flattened against one another until they're irreparably bent out of shape and pressed into one. Seeing the light at the end of the tubby tunnel, their mashed, conjoined bodies do bring their souls closer to each other, so as a last hope, they begin praying to God, then for the support of all who have helped them in their journey from Onet to the Deep Darkness. Their combined, trans-dimensional prayers resound all throughout the world and inspire anyone listening to pray for the safety of Ness and his friends. That includes you, the reader, just like it did when you started praying for them while holding that Super Nintendo gamepad, or whatever controller was plugged in when you emulated the game. 
Anyway, your own transdimensional prayer, combined with everyone else's in this universe, causes the four to become enveloped in a pure white flame. As it spreads, tiny beads of light, seen earlier in the Fountains of Life by Ness's Your Sanctuaries, work to push back the walls of flesh and open a space for the four to escape. Pokey begs for them to stop, as he clutches his stomach in agony until he pops. Now this is really disgusting. What happens next is described as a sock turning inside out, except the sock is your surroundings. The exhausted party finds themselves alive and free from that pinkish nightmare realm. But miraculously, so is Pokey, although he's not doing so hot as Gigas is now ready to be born. You see, Pokey's body hadn't actually towered and twisted around them. It was a hallucination brought on by the Rift and also probably Gigas. Pokey is still left grabbing at his stomach in torment then, as he starts to heave and projectile vomits about a gallon of sickly greenish yellow liquid all at once. Like a horror film, again, Pokey's jaw is wrenched open and Gigas begins to emerge from within. It hurts! It hurts! Kill me, please! While it's still inside my body, kill both of us, it and me. I don't want to become a monster! Pokey cries in desperation as four thick, writhing, spider-like legs sprout out. Unfortunately, that's all we see of Kumi's interpretation of the incomprehensible king of demons that is Gigas. As the universal cosmic destroyer crawls out of its mother, the book transitions into another illusory sequence set in a baseball stadium, which involves Ness landing a perfect fastball pitch. I interpret it to be Gigas himself, dead center. He has successfully hit a grand slam home run, with his three friends as the base runners. As Ness cheers with great enthusiasm, the champions wake in Dr. Andonut's lab as their regular non-android selves. I'll try to make this as simple as possible, but primarily what happened, as explained by BuzzBuzz, Buzz, who's no longer dead, is that the reality our protagonists now find themselves in is a parallel world that overlapped and merged with the previous one. From here on out, they exist in an alternate universe, which is principally exactly the same, albeit with some changed variables, as Jeff so eloquently puts it. The world they were in before didn't disappear, it converged with another to become this slightly altered reality. In this new world, Jeff's parents, for example, had never divorced, and he'd always been an only child. But when Jeff sees his mom, he learns that she's pregnant with a baby boy she plans on naming Jack. Buzz Buzz explains that Gigas has slunk back into some abyss in the many universes, and that the rift in time has been closed, and it will not open again for at least another thousand years. His egg, i.e. the comet, never fell on Mount Onet, and Pokey was never made into his host. This does also mean that the Mr. Saturns never came to planet Earth, but the bee who's not a bee knows that Jeff and his father will build another, safer type of phase distorter in the years to come, so he promises that they'll be able to make contact once again. The other major difference in this reality is that Aloysius and Pokey are alive and kicking. However, the former is no longer the big boss of Minch supermarkets, having been imprisoned for crimes of embezzlement, tax evasion, and fraud. The president of the business is now Ness's father, who's allowing Picky and Lardna to rent their houses from him, rather than the other way around. Notice how I didn't say Pokey just now. That's because in this reality, he isn't part of the Minch family. He has always been the big brother of Ness and Tracy instead, and he's a far better person because of his positive upbringing. That's right, in the author's own words, mother has become brother. In Kumi's world, Ness and Pokey are canonically siblings by blood. What an ending. After reading this, I had one major question. If that hypothetical Mother 3 novel by the same author did exist, how would it work in terms of Pokey being the main antagonist? I think that it's still possible as Gigas is technically alive. He'll just need another 1000 years to escape his prison between dimensions, an amount of time that absolutely tracks. While the time span between both games is never specified, it's speculated that it could very well be a millennium, based on Leader's speech and certain comments from Pokey, who has become immortal. I can't imagine Mother 3 without a pseudo-Nazi pig empire, so perhaps Gigas could simply take the form of King P, since this almighty abomination must have retained the memory of its host from the original timeline. The only other question I'm left scratching my head about is how in the world Geeg from the first novel became this spider-like beast. 
His change in appearance was hardly explained at all in the game, but one can sort of fill in the blanks. I always presumed Geeg went insane after his confrontation with Ninten and the loss of Maria. Then he somehow gained more power than his body and mind could ever hope to contain. But that doesn't happen in the novel. Geeg leaves with Maria in peace. I guess I'll just have to regretfully throw my shoulders up into a shrug and chalk this enigma up to this book exists in an alternate reality to the first one. Curiously, Gigas's millennia-long revival in this novel can be likened to Ganon from the Legend of Zelda series and his unending cycle of reincarnation, or It, the similarly incomprehensible creature from the mind of Stephen King, who lies dormant for a set amount of years before resurfacing and pursuing its victims. The comparisons stem from the kids learning via a prophecy that 1,000 years prior to the present day, the ancient people of Scaraba built their pyramid in order to fight off Gigas the first time. But he was not fully destroyed, and they correctly predicted that his evil intent will be resurrected. With the final chapter completed and the book, or laptop, closed shut, I'd like to take a minute to discuss my closing thoughts on both of Saori Kumi's mother novels, and how they stack up against one another. Mother. The original story was a surprising, fun read that made lots of interesting choices to separate itself from the game, that could be seen as good or bad. I quite liked the decision to tell the story from Anna's perspective, and appreciated Geek's character arc, but I wasn't crazy about Ninten or Teddy's characterizations, though the former unquestionably rocked the boat and made for lots of funny, unexpected moments. Overall, I enjoyed the story as an alternate take on Mother, but understand why it may not be every fan's cup of tea. On the other hand, you have this book, which has some similarly eye-opening deviations, but in my opinion nails every villain and main character while expanding immensely on the stories of the supporting cast who didn't have much to work from in the first place. The direction Kumi took with our antagonist was genius. I loved every single scene with Belch, Aloysius, and Pokey, besides perhaps that finale. There's one part midway through the novel where Pokey is flipping through radio channels, and lands on a heavy metal station because he can relate to the lyrics about wanting to go to hell. How can you not love that? Backing up to my somewhat negative opinion of the climax, I realized Pokey excessively gaining an impossible amount of weight had to lead up to something, but I think it went a bit too far, and Geekish should have emerged sooner for a cosmically scary fight akin to the game, rather than remaining dormant for an end battle that's just kinda gross. The gang fighting an infinitely enormous, nude Pokey in place of Gigas isn't anything I would have guessed in a million years, and it's fun to talk about, so the change has got appeal in that sense, I suppose. I can't complain too much though, especially considering the amazingly shocking Gigas-like horror stuff from Ness's Magicant that came right before this final face-off. Fans often dream about what an Earthbound animated movie or television series would look like, and I think that with some tweaks to a few key moments from this novel, the answer is right here. If it were up to me, I'd certainly add Moonside back in. Remove the more questionable content like the predatory folks in Summers, also maybe skip that segment about Pooh being basically already married to a 7 year old he's been betrothed to since birth, then revamp the ending to better match the video game. Otherwise, I'm fine with the progression of the events as they happen here, and I think that adapting these moments could truly make for something special. All in all, I think that Mother fans should at least try reading one of these two books. Go for whichever one sounds more appealing. Again, order doesn't matter. And read the first few chapters. If I had to recommend one over the other, I'd choose Mother too, as I really enjoyed it and think Kumi got most of the characters right where it counts. The plot thoroughly captivated me from beginning to end in its own right too. I had only a rough idea of what was coming next, and that's awesome. It surprised me as a die-hard fan. Please let me know if you've already read these books or plan to in the future. Believe me when I say that even with all these spoilers, I left out lots of details you'll never know about unless you read them for yourselves, so we can chat about the crazy adventures based on these crazy couple of games. Special thanks to Niesu Nekoban for translating the novels in the first place, along with the following for creating the fan art showcased in this video. Le Grand Cahier, known in English as The Notebook, not that one, is the first in a set of three novels written by Hungarian author Agoda Kristof. 
Back when Mother 3 was still slated for release on the Nintendo 64, series creator Shigesato Itoi revealed that the names of the game's twin brothers, Lucas and Klaus, were inspired by the twin narrators of the same name from Kristoff's story. This is just one of many parallels to the game though. Factoring in every similarity, it's easy to see the heavy influence these books had on Itoi when he first wrote the game's script. The Notebook begins with Lucas and Klaus, who are made to live with their abusive grandmother in a border town to survive the war, as their mother can no longer support the two of them. Living conditions in this new home are vile. The children are left unbathed and barefoot as their grandmother sells all of their belongings. Even the townsfolk see the boys as scoundrels, not hesitating in physically and verbally abusing them. In order to adapt to this cruel environment, the twins vow to toughen themselves up via exercises of the body. They whip each other with belts to normalize pain, starve themselves to conquer hunger, and practice inflicting cruelty by murdering innocent creatures. In an effort to become truly stoic, their quote-unquote exercise of the mind involves repeating words and phrases their mom lovingly used to tell them until the meaning and sentiment is gone. Statements that make the twins tear up to remember have become too painful to bear, so they repress the memory of their mother, just like Klaus is forced to do as the masked man at the beginning of Mother 3's final battle. The twins record all their experiences and routines in the namesake notebook, with each entry presented as a separate chapter. Its purpose is to document precisely what happens as matter of fact, so they forbid defining feelings and using language like love, because love isn't a reliable, objective word. Like Mother 3 then, whose characters rarely emote, it's up to us to fill in the blanks as to the character's emotional state throughout these stories. The structure of this novel, and the boy's intense training, is probably what Itoi was referring to when he compared the book to an RPG, the children acclimating to pain and leveling up by hardening themselves. Itoi has stated that a fundamental theme of Mother 3 is welcoming those who may be dismissed otherwise. Duster, for example, is a strong, invaluable party member that was included in the game because Itoi wanted to portray a character with bad breath, a disabled leg, and living as a thief. Having friends like Duster then became symbols of not rejecting such people. It's an idea seen in many aspects of this first book, such as Harelip, a tragic girl described as cross-eyed with blackened teeth and pimples covering her body. Her mother is immobile, so Harelip has to care for herself by swiping food from town. When she steals from the boy's farm then, they don't scoff at her appearance or chase her away, recognizing instead a person looking out for her family. They befriend the girl because of her good intentions. In both the game and novel, the twins' mother dies gruesomely in front of them. In Mother 3, the boy's mother is killed violently when a once friendly creature pierces her heart, while in the notebook, a bombshell explosion kills their mother and newborn sister. In Mother 3, this is the event that changes everything. A sadness in Hanawa's abrupt murder permeates throughout the rest of the story and especially impacts the twins. In the notebook, however, their mom's sudden death happens towards the end, by which point they're so desensitized to trauma that the event actually leaves them rather unfazed. Lucas and Klaus's mother being caught in an explosion may have also been the intended way for Hinawa to die in Mother 3, as evidenced by a related, unused cutscene found within the game's data. Another major parallel in both stories is the communal effect of military occupation. Upon enemy victory in the notebook, their so-called liberators ravage the village before occupying the country, developing the town to their vision in a similar vein to the pig masks reform of Tasmili village. Tasmili turns from a place without need of regulation to being heavily officiated by a violent police force, threatening and punishing those not loyal to the new army. Pig masks to a certain capacity, e.g. their salute, resemble Nazi soldiers too, i.e. the opposition in Kristoff's story. When their father returns from the front in the notebook, he talks about needing to flee the country for his own safety, since he's targeted for being politically suspect. As a chance for escape, he doesn't care if he dies trying to cross the border's landmines, even though at this point in the story he's the only family the boys have left. The notebook ends with one last exercise for the twins, separation. After their father attempts to cross the border first, which detonates a landmine, killing him, Klaus steps over his father's corpse and over the fence, while Lucas stays behind. Mother 3's twins were forced into splitting apart, but in the novel, they choose to part ways as a final test of will. The Proof, the notebook sequel novel, picks up from the perspective of Lucas, who is now referred to as the village idiot because of his nervous disorder from the trauma he suffered during the war that ended five years ago. 
He's an outcast, living alone and unsure how to function without his brother by his side. He can't eat, he's afraid to go into his and Klaus's old room, and he neglects the garden because his memory fails him. His mental deterioration is reminiscent of Flint's obsession with finding his missing son. The proof's Lucas being shunned by his hometown reminds me of that same dynamic in Mother 3's Lucas too. The boy is labeled a crybaby by his peers, and is disdained from chapter 4 onward for rejecting Tazmili's pig mask influence by not accepting a happy box. The proofs Lucas eventually stumbles upon a woman trying to drown her baby, but can't go through with it. He takes the both of them in, and later adopts the deformed child, named Matthias, crippled because his mother tried to hide the fact she was pregnant by wearing a tight corset. His legs specifically are disabled, which could be, like Harelip, the thief and ally from the first book, an inspiration for Duster. There are a couple of lines in the game that suggest Duster has his limp because of a training accident, under his father's strict discipline. Lucas similarly pushes Matthias too hard, but in an opposite way, to correct his legs so that he can stand upright and, quote, walk like everyone else, unquote. Much like Wes, though, who expects too much from his son, Lucas loves Matthias and wants the very best for him, believing his method of parenting to be what the child needs to grow. When Matthias's mother leaves him and Lucas for the big city, the child is convinced she did so because he's crippled. Matthias is riddled with trust issues, insisting Lucas will leave him at an orphanage, resulting in vivid, recurring nightmares about losing his family. This likely resonated strongly with Etoy, because they share a similar mindset. If I had to say what my worst kind of nightmare might be, it would involve my friends and family all being evil. A psychological torment brought to life with the hallucinations of Wes, Klaus, and Flint on Tane Tane Island. Very disturbingly, the fear and despair and loneliness causes the seven-year-old Matthias to hang himself. This, of course, utterly defeats Lucas. He slumps into a worsened depression and no longer speaks, sleeping on top of the child's grave every night. Years pass like this, and at age 30, Lucas finally disappears from town. The end of the story transitions 20 more years from that moment to the perspective of a 50-year-old Klaus, just arriving by train in search of his brother. The book concludes with Klaus being taken into custody, having waited for his brother with an expired visa extension and an invalid ID. The authorities are not able to verify any record of Lucas or Klaus living in town, and reveal the notebook Lucas has been adding to since the first novel to likely be a work of fiction. This trippy ending sequence implies that all of what happened throughout these last two books are fabrications. With such a surprising revelation, it's as if the author wanted to betray the reader, since everything so far has been presented as fact while it was happening. Notably, Etoy revealed a similar desire to betray the player, when he explained that Earthbound 64's scenario had planned to dig in the direction that would upset people. While Etoy could be referring to anything narratively, a plot twist we did get that changes everything in Mother 3 is found during Leader's speech towards the end of the game. All of Tazmili's residents are memory-wiped survivors of a world-ending apocalypse, living their new lives as blissful lies. Speaking of, the third lie, the last book in this trilogy, elaborates that it wasn't actually a 50-year-old Klaus who came back to his hometown and was arrested. Well, it was, but Klaus, as we've known him throughout these two stories, doesn't really exist. Klaus is an alias Lucas has been using when he alone crossed the border all those years ago. Mixing up twins is a common trope in any kind of media, but in both Etoy's and Kristoff's tale, it is crucial for the sake of storytelling that these characters are twins so that their identities are easily swappable. Lucas confides during his arrest that he did write his manuscript as an embellished autobiography, and that he tries to write using facts, but at a given point, the story becomes so unbearable because of its very truth that he has to change it. It hurts too much. Lucas chose the assumed name of Klaus with a C, an anagram of his own name, in memory of his actual brother, Klaus with a K. The twins were separated at the age of 4, not 15, due to an event dubbed The Thing, as in, the thing that ruined all their lives. At this terribly young age, the boy's father admitted to their mom that he was having an affair, which ultimately resulted in his wife shooting and killing him with his own revolver. One of the bullets ricocheted into Lucas's leg, crippling him, so he was sent away to be hospitalized. Klaus, with a K, was made to live with his dad's lover, while their mom was transferred to a psychiatric ward, having become clinically insane believing she killed Lucas. During his years spent in the hospital not receiving any word from his family, Lucas became bitter, lashing out at the staff and bullying his fellow patients. 
While only a character he imagined for the manuscript, it becomes obvious that Matthias was meant to represent Lucas as a child. Lucas was always the one with the deformed leg, believing that everyone's families hate them because of their disabilities, just like Matthias' greatest fear and the very reason for killing himself in the proof. Their mother didn't actually die from a shell landing in their garden like in the notebook either. It was instead Lucas's hospital that was bombed from the war. This forced him to relocate, to live with a mean peasant woman he learned to call grandmother. Of course, when Lucas decided to cross the border then, it wasn't his father he made go first. It was a willing stranger Lucas only claimed to be his dad as a convincing story for when he made it to the other side. It is in this country that Lucas, claiming to be an adult of 18, assumed the name Klaus with a C. Three lies so that he wouldn't be sent back. His alias is the third lie. It is a sick, dying Lucas at age 50 who returns and is imprisoned in town looking for his brother Klaus. When he finally does find and meet with his brother in the capital though, the encounter is anything but wholesome. Like protagonists changing in Mother 3's chapters, the book shifts one last time to Klaus's point of view painting the tale of a miserable man who's wasted away his life and health working at a printing press. The dramatic irony of Flint just barely missing his son in Mother 3 is mirrored when Klaus is forced to temporarily move to the same town as his brother because of the war. He actually sees Lucas performing at bars but doesn't recognize him. As an adult, Klaus dedicates himself to taking care of his mother in their childhood home where the thing happened, and he hasn't left her side since. The problem, though, is that their mom never mentally recovered. She still insists that Lucas died by her hand, chastising Klaus for being the lesser twin. Her vision of Lucas is of a perfect child, while Klaus is reproached in every way. It's an obsession with the son she lost that again harkens back to Flint and his compulsive searching for Klaus. Because of this toxic relationship, Klaus slowly begins to despise the brother he never got to know. So after 46 years, when the twins are finally reunited, Klaus shuts Lucas out completely. Like Lucas did in his manuscript, Klaus lies about his life, claiming their mom really is dead and fabricates his story as one he wishes were true. Much like the self-brainwashed residents of Tasmili living their ideal roles while hiding the truth. He rejects Lucas as his brother because of a lifetime of spite developed from an awful mother. Lucas leaves dejectedly and decides to jump in front of a moving train, killing himself. The book series ends with Klaus watching his brother's coffin being lowered next to their father's grave, thinking that the four of them will be reunited soon, much like Klaus's last sentiment in Mother 3 following his suicide. When their mom passes away, Klaus will have no reason to go on, so the final sentence of this trilogy has him stating, not a bad idea, the train. As Itoi was inspired by the twins' bond in the notebook, it's very likely their separation through a time skip and this tragic theme of never truly being able to reunite again strongly influenced Itoi as well. Klaus's death in Mother 3 may very well have been a reflection of Klaus's plan for suicide, and Lucas's actual suicide in The Third Lie. Curiously, Lucas putting himself in danger by crossing the train tracks in Mother 3 is given a lot of attention too. If the player tries to enter the train tunnel before progressing the story, a man and his twin brother from the other side of the tracks will pull Lucas aside, saving his life, an action that can be repeated again and again for new dialogue. The pair of them will scold Lucas in slightly different ways, telling him not to throw his life away. Paired with the fact that there's real risk in Lucas getting hit by the train, it's a bit disturbing now given the context of Itoi's inspiration. I've nearly exhausted this gold mine of a trilogy, but another new diamond has been surfaced by fan translator Niesu Nekoban, who gifted the Mother 1 and 2 novelizations to English speakers back in 2021. If you weren't a fan of some of the, uh, creative liberties writer Saori Kumi took with these beloved characters, you'll be happy to hear that another individual was responsible for this new book, Mother Invasion from the Unknown, so there is no connection to Kumi's novel. 
What's more, this thing isn't a novel, but a gamebook reminiscent of the interactive choose-your-own-adventure franchise with branching paths leading to multiple endings. Nintendo's no stranger to this genre, as they actually had their own adventure book series from the early 90s, similarly asking readers to make decisions on how to proceed but also mortify librarians everywhere by requiring those readers to physically write in the book in order to keep track of items they collect and to solve puzzles. Mother Invasion from the Unknown is a more involved gamebook of this style, working brilliantly as a turn-based RPG converted from a digital experience into a tangible adventure. Playing this for the first time and having not experienced anything like it before, I was amazed at how all the mechanics were translated to a completely different medium. You can essentially do anything that's possible in the video game, from returning home to mom and eating your favorite meal, to grinding for experience and money to buy a better weapon. Besides some wild story differences I'll be exploring later, this feels like a successful port of the game to inferior hardware. That hardware in this case just happens to be good old pen and paper. Having an understanding of the original and how it plays does actually help you in some cases as well. To show what I mean, at one point you're given the option to speak with one of three people in the reindeer train station. After choosing the boy in the cap, the middle-aged man, or the old woman, you'll have to flip to the page where Doug has left the platform, so you can't talk to them all at once and it's kind of a pain to get back in there. If you're already familiar with Mother though, you'll know that the old woman is the one with an important item you'll need. The other two individuals are not particularly helpful, so you can save time by choosing Gran Gran. Do note that solutions won't always be one-to-one -one, though. Pippi, for example, who is actually the daughter of Podunk's mayor in this, not just some local girl he wants rescued to look good in time for his re-election, is found hiding in the casket closest to Doug at the bottom of the Podunk Cemetery's underground crypt, rather than the one that's furthest away. This gamebook is its own thing, too. Another separate spin on Itoi's original work. If you're wondering whether or not these different interpretations, Kumi's novel and Akio Higuchi's gamebook here, can be considered canon, I'd say definitely not, as they both contain material that directly contradicts the video game's plot. However, I think it's okay to headcanon certain supplemental depictions and backstories for these characters if you like them, especially to fill in minute details about NPCs who weren't given much screen time in the original. I like to look at these two retellings mainly as alternate universes, differing takes on the cast and settings of Etoy's world that provide new stories using the IP but aren't there to override or retcon his masterpiece. Pulling Invasion from the Unknown out from the darkness and viewing it in this light, we can experience the gamebook as the fun divergence it's supposed to be. If you're interested in what this wild ride has to offer and want all of its surprises intact, you're safe to watch until the time displayed on screen. I'll also remind you when the time comes. This video will be segmented into a couple of parts. The first is a brief explanation of how to play, and a look into the game's surprisingly gory introduction, while the second segment will be a spoiler-heavy analysis of the abundance of shocking themes found within. How to play Step 1 is to grab a pencil. Wait, scratch that. Step 1 is to give away any pencil eraser machines you may have lying around to your little sister to store for the time being. Then when it's safe, you can initiate step 2, which is to secure a pencil. Alternatively, you can save time and use a pen instead, which would remove the need for steps 1 and 2. I think we're off to a great start here. Okay, for real now, since a print version of this book is not available in English, you won't be able to write directly into it. And I don't think you want to tarnish it anyway, considering how much the Japanese version goes for online. To avoid confusion and buyer's remorse, you can use the free Google Doc on Niasu Nekoban's website. Links are in the description. This allows you to read the book digitally and print out the necessary pages to mark up willy-nilly as you play. That's economical and convenient. Dealing with printers is not, however. I wish mine were possessed by a poltergeist so I had an excuse to smash it. As a tip, I recommend downloading and printing each sheet individually rather than straight from the webpage to keep everything orderly and presentable. With a writing utensil in hand and a short stack of papers ready to go, let's dive into the game's systems. Page 1 features the level check and battle point chart. Rather than level ups being capped at a whopping 99, Invasion from the Unknown's highest level is a cool 5. Just like in the video game, your maximum number of psychic points and HP increases with each level, and you'll gain a new Psy ability or two you'll be able to use if you've got enough PP. The battle point chart below is here for non-Psy attacks to indicate if you've won or lost the particular enemy encounter. You actually fill this out before playing the game, and it's easy. There is a row of empty boxes underneath 10 letters, A through J. A number, 1 through 10, must be assigned to each letter. You just can't repeat numbers. In certain battle scenarios, the foe will have a set number, let's call it 4, to compete against your letter, let's say C. 
If the number you put beneath C is 5 or higher, you win the fight. If it's lower, you lose. In the event of a tie, you'll do another round with the following letter, that being D in this case. The exact repercussions of dying are left a little open to interpretation, so you're free to go back and try a lost battle again. And if, by chance, there is no way for you to come out on top in the skirmish, you may return to a save spot, the scenarios marked B, and re-roll your numbers, if you will. Nyasu, the translator, wanted to make it clear that the game can be a bit merciless, so it's up to you how seriously you play by these rules. There is a sort of trick we both discovered, where you are able to endlessly take the same path to repeat victorious battles an infinite number of times. The enemy's assigned number does not change, so you're always guaranteed to win. I see repeating this loop over and over to earn as many experience points as you'd like as the gamebook equivalent to level grinding near a spot that allows you to heal for free. It would be silly to physically flip through the necessary pages to traverse the same path four times, since all you'd be doing is wasting precious time, time that could be spent playing more gamebooks, so Niasu shortened the concept to multiplying EXP. That way, if you know for certain you found yourself a stable loop with the same end result, you can just pretend you went through the motions and give yourself four times the reward. How I approached this was successfully clearing a battle, then figuring out how to get back and fight it again. Once I knew I had a stable path to victory, I'd give myself the extra EXP and money without going too overboard. Think of it like the Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster's boost menu and its adjustable multipliers, or the easy ring hack for the game this very book is based on. Even with this quality of life measure, the quest can still be quite challenging, as brute force isn't always enough to ensure a win. There are some clear limitations in place for balance too, meaning you can't just go and give yourself 120 EXP from the get-go. You are initially capped at 50 experience points, which means you can't go higher than level 3 until you progress far enough in the story, making me think that the writer was aware of this so-called trick anyway. You can decide how you'd like to enjoy the game, but it's not as if a line hadn't already been drawn. Now that I've justified my own playstyle, I realize I've been talking for a while and have only covered this very first page. But the rest of the instructions are incredibly straightforward, so let's breeze right through them. This is a check chart for experience points and money earned from battles. The game makes it easy as 1 EXP equals $1, so if you earn 5 EXP from battle, that's 5 bucks in the bank. This is mother, so you'll need to ask your dad for money. And when you do, the total amount in this field must be crossed out and replaced with a zero. You'll then transfer the amount you had over to the money check chart box, aka Doug's on hand cash. You'll start the game with $20, so make sure to write that in here before you begin. The following boxes allow you to keep track of your current HP and Psy. Get drained of life or use up psychic energy in battle? These values will go down. Sleep at a hotel? The values will go back up, restored to the maximum amount allowed by your current level. The game will tell you precisely when to tick off the boxes in the Mark and Melody check chart, so don't fret about those. The next bit is where you're going to write in everything you've been given or have purchased throughout the journey. You can even sell certain equipment back to shops if you don't need it anymore. Like the rope, which you absolutely should not buy because it is one item in the game that is 100% useless. Seriously, it's a thing you can own to say that you own it and that's it. This leaves just one more segment of the progress tracker sheets. The step memo, which is by far the most convoluted thing on here, so here it goes. I'm just kidding. It's only here as a log of which pages you flip to so you can take a break and not come back hopelessly lost wondering where in Sam Hill this boy has been. You can think of it as a trail of breadcrumbs, but we're not here for bread, it's prime rib time baby. So let's get to the meaty content of this story. If you still want to avoid spoilers, don't jump ship yet. This is just the introduction. I promise I'll tell you when to quietly leave out the back. Anyway, I've been this long without mentioning our protagonist's full name. You may be amused to learn that it's not Ninten or even Ken this time, but Doug. Doug Holloway. If you're curious about the last names of his allies, they are Anna Bruton and Lloyd Schneider. Howdy. Teddy or Hurricane Joe does not appear in this story, so sorry Teddy fans. I think he's cooler without a last name anyway. The prologue opens familiarly in the early 1900s with Doug's great-grandparents, George and Maria. Their tale is told through a series of newspaper excerpts. George Holloway and his wife Maria both went missing on the interstate highway when driving home to Podunk, which is apparently located in Maine, USA, from the town of Marysville. All that remained of the couple was the Ford Model T they had been driving, which was discovered at the foot of Mount Toy about 20 miles from town. With no other clue to the investigation, the search ceased exactly one month later when local police dismissed rumors that the mysterious black clouds that had covered Mount Toy were related to the incident, even though the clouds curiously vanished on the same day as George and Maria. 
Then, about two years after the search had officially been called off, George was miraculously discovered collapsed along the shore near another town in Maine, LA. That sounds wrong to say since LA's name comes from the city in California. Anyway, George was transferred to a hospital in Youngtown for treatment, but while he regained consciousness, he claimed to have no memory of the two years during which he went missing, and had stated to have no knowledge of the whereabouts of his wife Maria. The book then fast forwards 84 years, in 1988, to Doug's point of view. He's dragged out of dreamland not by his mother, but by the military helicopters that have occupied the skies for the last several days. We're told that Podunk is on lockdown by martial law because of murders, disappearances, and other strange things happening all over the place every day. Mr. Crockett, for example, is a local shoemaker who insists that he saw his nephew Harold wandering aimlessly while he was out fishing, staggering along the water's edge like a marionette with a broken string, staring blankly off into the distance. That's slightly concerning in and of itself, but made all the more disturbing when we learn that Harold's been deceased for a while now. He was hit and killed by an express train running along the nearby Paradise Line sometime last year. Mr. Crockett was not having a flashback or hallucinating either. He definitely saw his nephew out walking around as a member of the undead. Three days after the sighting, the vice principal of Podunk High School, Mitch Holland, was murdered right in the middle of the street by a creature with incredibly sharp claws. It tore the body to shreds and left what looks like wild animal hair scattered on the ground all around his corpse. If these horrific supernatural occurrences have one thing in common, it's that these strange black clouds that rolled over Mount Etoy nearly a century ago have returned, which cannot be another coincidence. This fog is a bad omen, and whatever is causing it just may be responsible for all the paranormal phenomena plaguing poor Podunk, and unbeknownst to Doug, the greater world around his small hometown. Current newspapers have reported that scientists and a military research team went up to the mountain to investigate the clouds, but as you could probably guess, they never came back down. Half a year ago, Doug's own father went MIA when he was out at work, but all investigations have led to a dead end. So Doug's mom reluctantly gave up the search and threw away anything that belonged to her husband, out of sadness and no doubt anger at the situation. Doug hasn't yet given up on his old man though, and inadvertently finds a clue when he mischievously decides to explore the home's attic instead of finishing his homework. Eventually, a diary belonging to his great-grandfather with a cover reportedly as rough and rugged as a tombstone falls to his feet. Upon cracking open the bygone book, he learns that rather than a traditional diary, it's actually more like a letter. A letter written from George's deathbed addressed to his descendant in the distant future, because he had the power to foresee that at 12 years of age, his great-grandson Doug would be reading his dying words. George states that it is Doug's destiny to find and remember a certain special song, the key to saving planet Earth from calamity. Like himself, Doug has special abilities. In the boy's case, telekinesis and telepathy, with an even greater power that lives dormant within him. George explains that Doug must channel these powers in order to fight his enemies, amusingly giving him the okay to use violence to solve his problems. George also mentions allies that will assist him along the way, including Doug's own father, Jack, who is aware of the situation and has gone into hiding to protect Doug, so he can only be reached via telephone. Doug will journey with two aforementioned friends, who are notably said to be children from other families in George's bloodline, and as such, have powers similar to, and perhaps even stronger than, Doug's. This means that by extension, Anna and Lloyd are related to Doug, so love triangles are off limits. And also, Lloyd has Psy in the story. Something of note to me is that Anna being likely more powerful than the main protagonist is a constant scene in the video game and the novelization, which continues on here. The diary then cuts off abruptly as the rest of the page has been torn off. Wiping away his tears, Doug then hears his mother screaming downstairs, and you should be able to guess what happens next. An electric lamp possessed by a poltergeist floating around the room attacks Doug, who explodes the rogue appliance into fine dust with his mind powers. That life-changing experience, paired with his ancestors' words, is enough for the plucky kid to get serious. So readying a backpack loaded up with a knife, sandwiches made by his mama, rain gear, extra pairs of underwear, $20, and an inhaler. You don't have to write down any of this like I did besides the $20, by the way. Doug sets out without much fuss from his mother, and where he immediately travels next is up to you. The first decision of this gamebook is to head north or south. It is here that I'm going to give you, my lovely viewers, a third option, as this is where you should stop the video and play the gamebook for yourself if you'd like to remain spoiler free. I'm not going to summarize each and every detail of the plot, just the darker moments, and there's a lot of them if you couldn't tell by the prologue, but plenty will be discussed regardless so this is your final warning. For those of you still with me, where shall we head next? 
I say north, because that takes us directly to the charming little district literally named Skid Row for Doug's first confrontation with a feral man possessed by dark forces. You can rely on the default knife, which either does the job or gets Doug strangled, but not killed, he just loses two heart points. I mean health points. Wait, no, there are hit points here. I'm sorry, it gets confusing when the same initialism is used across the board for these types of games, albeit spelled out differently. Anyway, Doug kicks the fiend in the crotch and runs away to the heart of Podunk. The simplest way to handle this baddie is to purchase a bat and strike him in the head, forcing the creep to come to his senses for a respectable two experience points. You see, this is the first exploitable loop I was referring to and showed off earlier. If you have the bat, one can easily flip to scenario number 97 and head back to Skid Row to get in that same confrontation and smack him in the skull with no Hewlett Packards, HP lost, or psychic points spent. Alternatively, if you choose to fight with a knife and your number that correlates to C happens to be greater than 3, you can keep repeating this loop for a slightly higher 3 EXP, again with no repercussions. While you are technically able to lose all of your HP if you enter the brawl with a low amount for some reason and lose, you won't die in the sense that you can't resume play. Reaching 0 HP doesn't make for lost progress, it just locks you out of certain paths you could have taken otherwise. The only way to trigger a true game over is if the game explicitly tells you that your characters have died. When the game punishes you more than simply subtracting a few Hamtaro plushies from your total and allowing you to escape, it wants to make sure you suffer a swift and violent end. These game overs are so hilariously brutal I can't even believe some of them are in here. And there's over 40! I've been pretty eager to talk about them, so I'm just gonna rattle off a bunch in quick succession. Here we go! <clears throat> Doug can be run over by a truck, shanked by an old woman, mowed down by a polar bear, who's rumored to have already eaten another child alive, impaled by a starman spear, crushed or squeezed to death by robots, sliced clean in half, roasted in the desert sun, gunned down by the guy who lends out his piloting services, yes, this one, petrified, engulfed in flames and reduced to ash, blown to bits after running over a landmine, torn to shreds by and turned into a zombie, overtaken by the alien leader Geeg's dark mind control and convinced to dash off of a cliff, charred by a violent lightning assault, devoured by an alligator, a gargoyle, or a titany, take your pick, and finally the most surprising death of all, smashed into pieces by freaking Cthulhu. You know those curse words from the video game that can be given by scientists that have a funny effect in battle? Well, they make an appearance here. And in the game book, the curse words are revealed to be the infamous occult chant. Using the curse words in the lake at Mount Toy summons the Great Old One from his slumber, on call to mercilessly end Doug's quest. You'd think being led unexpectedly into any of these bad endings would be a bit grating, but the way these are written are so morbidly entertaining it kinda makes the rigmarole worth it. Take Doug's battle with the Little Saucer, for example. Quote, And this time, it hit me dead on. I didn't feel any pain or anything at all, really. Just my consciousness shattering into a million pieces. Unquote. That's amazing. I first read this line about a year ago, and I still think about it every now and again. What a vivid, profound description of being utterly vaporized. You can find yourself in some pretty vicious predicaments in the original game, but the text is, of course, nowhere near this graphic. While a mad gorilla beating up your party until everyone's unconscious is a thing that can happen, it'd be a stretch of the imagination to call it gruesome, because how exactly the kids are injured is not detailed. The guilty ape is just a static sprite in front of a black background after all. Just try to take 90% of these enemies seriously anyway, you can't do it, it's impossible. The game book being, well, a book without graphical and text limitations allows for manga-style pictures and descriptive paragraphs, which naturally ensures the same sort of fight is going to be much more explicit in print than its depiction in an 8-bit RPG. There is no fainting here either. Our heroes' bodies aren't rushed to a hospital and replaced with cute little ghosts until we've coughed up enough money to revive them. Doug and his friends unquestionably perish horribly via these bad endings, and often don't even have bodies left because they were obliterated. No crying until the end? Well, that's not too challenging, as there are 43 bad endings, so you won't have to hold back the waterworks for very long. Let's pretend we're good at this game, though, and get the ball rolling by rescuing the missing Pippi and buttering up the mayor so that Doug can pass through Podunk's barricade, guarded by several dozen uniformed policemen armed with shotguns, who aim their barrels at the boy before letting him through to the next town over, Marysville, which isn't under martial law. 
In Marysville, Doug comments on an overhead interstate highway sign leading to Jerusalem's lot, a name taken directly from the short horror story by Stephen King. Fitting as it also takes place in Maine, like the majority of Stephen King's works. It's not the only reference though, as Higuchi mentions the famous writer in this book's afterword, and at one point in the story, prepare yourself for this, Lloyd is temporarily transformed into a Saint Bernard, a type of dog chosen perhaps because it's the same breed as Cujo, a playful pooch turned into a carnivorous canine when a rabid bat bites him. If this influence was intentional, I think as long as we keep Mr. Bat away from Lloyd, he should be fine. Now, I know I can't just casually mention Lloyd's unprecedented transfiguration and move on, so let's explore how the good boy turned into a good boy. The Onyx Hook In the video game, the Onyx Hook is a crucial item that can be used limitlessly to warp from anywhere in the real world to the fantastical realm of Magicant. A sugary pink dreamlike kingdom equated to being in a mother's womb that exists inside the mind of its queen, who wishes to hear every piece of the aforementioned song vital to saving the planet. In this game book, the device has the same powers of fast travel, but unlike the original, this onyx hook seems to require payment for passing between the two worlds, as when it's exposed to the light of the world above, it turns the person holding it into a dog. It is implied that one who's courageous enough can withstand the spell's effects, however, as Lloyd believes he allowed himself to become a dog, because he never wanted to get himself involved in fighting all the awful monsters that constantly threaten the trio's lives. The first truly frightening ordeal with the evil creatures born from Geek's invasion is seen when Doug boards the train car leaving Snowman for the first time. The passengers initially seem ordinary, but when one of them turns towards Doug and reveals a disfigured face with chapped purple lips and a nearly toothless mouth, his heart sinks when he realizes a zombie somehow snuck itself in among the crowd. But that fear for them quickly turns into fear of them when he notices everyone else's faces have rotted away too. This train to Busan, I mean Spookan, is full of the living dead, and if you don't want Doug to join their ranks, there's only one way to survive. He must hurl himself through the window into a conveniently placed cabbage patch as the ghost train pulls into the station for the porter to deal with. If that wasn't traumatic enough, the first thing Doug witnesses when he enters the town of Spookan is the bone of an arm dangling from a truck's open window, belonging to a human skeleton. The streets are completely deserted, save for more walking corpses and pseudo-zombies who turn back to normal once defeated, so the only other individuals able to chat are this drunken man who warns about the local haunted manor, and a spiritual therapist who can restore Doug's senses if his heart begins to turn to stone in said haunted house. I think it's really cool that you may never have to visit the healer, if you can avoid the bionic bat's petrifying attack, but if you do make the wrong choices and are struck with this deadly affliction, the player is rewarded with extra lore, almost as if to make up for the inconvenience. Turning to stone allows the player to enter the healer's psychic clinic, Well, they'll be treated for free because the man divulges the fact that he's indebted to Doug's father. That's a detail you could miss completely, which reminds me of RPG characters that have easily missable dialogue only accessible when speaking with them at a particular moment in the game. The Mother series is all about these little bonuses rewarding curious players, and it's a big reason why I can't stop coming back to it. Another instance of an optional route that adds to the story is not having Anna's hat in your inventory as Doug heads into the church. Normally, the book describes Anna as being alone, with no one sitting at the large pipe organ inside. However, if you enter hatless, a priest occupies that spot softly playing hymns, and will ask Anna if anyone is there because he can't see for himself, revealing the man to be blind. It's not exactly necessary to know these things, but I think it's interesting that an unlucky player gets to objectively experience more content than someone who always comes out on top. Unless the former type of player gets frustrated and gives up trying to finish the game, that is. Speaking of Anna and the haunted house, she surprisingly provides the key because it's actually her old home. The girl has not been able to enter though because it was owned by her parents and she's still too upset about their deaths to face it. Lonesomely journeying through the morbid mansion to learn a melody from the mad piano that plays itself is quite the challenge, as creatures of the night like Shroudly the blood spattered zombie lunge at Doug with a taste for flesh. Melting the ghastly cretin with PK fire is notably the only way to get the dentures of all things in this game, and gifting these no doubt musty false teeth to a sexist old man is actually what leads you to Magicant for the first time. It's fascinating how certain side quests from the original change and become part of the main plot in this spin-off. In Mother, the old man is an eccentric guy rumored to be older than 300 because of a special illness curing mouthwash he's concocted that's apparently the secret to living a long, long life. 
He only needs his dentures because he can't speak well without them, he mumbles if you don't try to communicate via telepathy, but in this book, the dentures are some sort of mystical tool he can use to speak of the other world instead. Once the party, which includes Lloyd the dog, gains access to the previously mentioned LA, Anna recalls visiting the town of Corruption and Chaos, aka Maine's personal garbage dump with her uncle a long time ago, but never again. What kind of town is it? Doug asks innocently. <sighs> the kind of town where there aren't many decent people. Anna replies with a sigh. She then proceeds to list off a number of hard drugs by name that can apparently be bought more easily than chewing gum. I was recently in LA to visit Super Nintendo World, by the way, so I thought it'd be funny to go to a gas station and buy a pack of gum, so here's a picture of the receipt. I won't say or show what exactly Anna said in fear of breaking YouTube's guidelines, but if you'd like to know, then it's on page 69 of the document. Because of course it is. The kids and their loyal dog are made to fight a wonderfully silly off-model Starman soon after arriving, whose appearance is described as if it's an alien wearing a costume. Are these really supposed to be rectangular goggles? The face-off doesn't have to last very long though, as Doug can shoot it with a laser gun and dissolve the sad sap into an unrecognizable gooey mess. He then walks off the horror he just inflicted to throw shade at the South Bronx by comparing the disarray in LA to what he imagines it being like in that part of New York City, as he observes the vagrants and drug dealers that surround him. From the heart of town here, you have the difficult choice to visit the ocean, get mugged, or if you've already borrowed and destroyed the war veteran's tank back in the Yucca Desert, have him hunt the children down as he attempts to murder them with a handgun, rather than, I don't know, demand they pay for repairs? The crazy part is though, he actually keeps true to his threat in two of the bad endings. So you'd better hope you purchase tickets to the live house on a whim, because the kids have nowhere else to go, and the security guard is not letting anyone in regardless of who's chasing them. Even with the passes, however, they're not safe yet, as unfortunately for the bouncer, the old fogey ain't got tickets, but he's getting in anyway because he's not afraid to shoot the doorman, just doing his job in cold blood. The sound of the gunshot is drowned out by the music and mobs of people inside, so the children slip into the crowd to try and lose him. They manage to push themselves all the way to the front row, where the singer on stage demands that they step up into the spotlight to sing the blues. You can politely decline, but that ends with the heroes face down in a pool of blood because the gunman catches up with them. So with really no other choice, Doug and Anna grab a pair of microphones and let it out. The duo doesn't croon about how they used to think they were so smart or not being able to hide the holes in their hearts. They instead belt out about the crazy man in pursuit of them, who's now watching as an audience member below. Because he's gone insane, he actually decides he likes what he's hearing and begins whistling along. After the podunk blues outro, the man with a gun snaps out of his good mood and the kids hurry to the stage side exit. They are so close to being followed out the door. But luckily, that same singer who brought the kids on stage puts his hand on their assailant's shoulder and says, you're not going anywhere, friend, until you sing us some blues. And that's the last time you'll hear from him. Moving forward, you are no longer able to return to this part of town, not that you'd want to anyway. Now that I think about it, the kids should have just used the onyx hook to warp back to Magicant when they were trying to lose him. Speaking of getting lost though, I think now is a perfect time for a story that's relevant, I promise. In 2022, my wife and I were staying in an Arizona city about four hours from where we live for a mini vacation. We went out one night to check out a cool lava river cave we had heard about, so we filled our backpacks with flashlights, water, and a few snacks expecting we'd be in and out in about an hour. I didn't want to explore much longer than that because we had just booked a haunted history tour scheduled for 9 o'clock. We were fully aware that there'd be no cell service underground, and we considered the possibility of getting lost, but figured as long as we'd start heading back at around 8 we'd be fine. Well, we entered the tunnel at around 7.30 and did not find our way back out for another two hours. We thought we were keeping track of where we were going, but the twisty lava tube was filled with numerous branching paths and it all sort of blended together. There was nothing to easily differentiate one area from the next, besides some low ceilings you had to basically crawl through, and some occasional graffiti like bouillon soup and hot dog, but they were few and far between. My unreliable sense of direction didn't help us escape. So we wound up running in circles. I'm not gonna lie, it was kind of scary being disoriented in the cold dark, looping around a labyrinth in different configurations like it was some kind of special hell we were trapped in. I wanted to talk about this less than stellar experience, because this gamebook's interpretation of the Crystal Cavern and Magic reminded me a lot of our unanticipated little maze run. Finding your way to the other side of this dungeon is incredibly confusing at first, because you'll start off with two choices, east or west. Depending on that choice, you'll arrive at either a fork in the path or a four-way crossroads, which continues on until you arrive at a dead end, a point of interest, or the exit. 
I do like that options are marked with an X once you finish them, so the correct path leading out of Magicant is clear on subsequent trips, like memorizing the route back home in the original, but that initial trek through the tunnels brought the fear right back to me. At least in the lava tunnel I explored, there was no dragon waiting to roast me at the end of a wrong turn, just a wife with a dragon tattoo to give me an icy gaze. Speaking of the dragon, this goofy guy in the video game is just kinda there because Dragon Quest did it. It's a boss that holds the sixth melody, and it looks hilarious, and that's about it. It poses an awesome challenge, but in the game book, a test of physical strength this fight is not. As much like Geeg, all psi attacks against it are useless. Just before the dragon prepares to breathe its last breath of fire and deliver the killing blow, Anna reaches out to the dragon with her mind and learns that it isn't evil or acting as a puppet for malevolent forces. This creature is acting out because its young was killed by a being from the stars, and is stuck dreaming about a time when its child was still alive. That's a terribly tragic backstory to include for this character that didn't originally have one, a theme that presents itself a few times in the story and will again before the true ending is reached. Even though the gang didn't really solve its troubles, they just listened to it sing a sorrowful melody, kissed it on the forehead, and lulled it back to sleep. It's time to find a way to transform Lloyd back into a human. And who's better for the job than Doug's father? Jack finally comes out of hiding to rescue the kids on Mount e Toy from the killer R7038 robot, and reveals that he has psi abilities of his own to see into the future, like George, and use PK healing. He informs Doug that he and his friends must journey to the nearby mountain lake, and gives a hint on how to defeat Guy by warning everyone to conserve as much Psy as they're able to. You can see a full front-facing profile of Doug's papa in this image, but unfortunately he's faceless, so Kenji Masuda, the illustrator, opted to keep his appearance a mystery. That or the man's face was taken by Ko the face dealer or the Dark Lord from Utopia. He could even secretly be Indiana Joe from the Super Mario Bros. Super Show. Type your theories in the comments, I'd love to read them. Since Doug's father arrived in an SUV and not a tank though, he didn't actually have the means to take care of a giant robot, so it reappears as soon as he waves goodbye. You can go against Jack's advice by attempting to fight it again with Psy, but that just wastes it completely and severely injures Lloyd, so I don't recommend rebelling against the man in this case. Regardless of his physical condition, however, the dog who's become a real boy will freeze up when they reach the lake in fear of their impending doom. The kids thankfully discover a motorboat at the water's edge, so they hop in and try to start it, but the engine's wires have been cut, and the only one there who's capable of fixing it is Lloyd, who's currently as stiff as a board. This next part is pretty funny. There are two paths here, one leading to safety, and the other to the robot seizing them all. You have no choice in the matter. The correct option must be taken if you have enough experience points. So how does Doug use this abundance of EXP he's accumulated to survive the life or death situation? He takes a deep breath to clear his mind and channels all of his energy into the palm of his hand, which is then used to slap Lloyd across the face as hard as he can so that his friend comes back to reality and repairs the vehicle so they can all make a break for it. The boat takes them out to the middle of the lake, but then sputters out of commission, where a telepathic voice asks for a specific item, the can of words. This is an example of the game being ruthless if you aren't well enough prepared. Using the curse words, of course, causes the cosmic horror to obliterate everyone, but not owning any at all results in a less interesting demise at the hands of the colossal automaton who had ample time to meet you at the busted boat. The words of love are required to access the laboratory, calling forth a giant whirlpool that drags everyone down to the bottom of the mirror. In the original, the place they wake up in is referred to as the Unknown Lab, but George has been here as he's the one who constructed Eve so that the heroes may match the might of the enemy robots. In the novel, this lab belonged to Lloyd's father, Dr. Distorto, who is a generic enemy type in the video game. Here though, it's revealed that the strawberry tofu-loving scientist who traded Doug the can of words for his favorite snack is in charge of this underwater base. He's the director at the instant voice lab we visited earlier, but also a doctor of engineering at this power robotics laboratory. For the last 20 years, the doctor's been ordered by the United States Army to work with Eve, a robot recovered from a crashed UFO programmed to fight for Doug. And fight for Doug she does. But sadly for even less time than you'd expect, as the ever incessant R7038 must be dealt with right away. While Eve is very powerful, she can't overtake the threat without a self-destructive sacrifice, which is a canon event in the Motherverse as it happens in all three of these stories. So with tears in his eyes, Doug gives the command and the two mechs explode into scrap metal. Eve then plays the final melody for the children, which ultimately has the effect of restoring Queen Mary's lost spirit. The Queen then reveals herself in person and explains that she's not actually a human being, but an alien who had left her home planet for Earth, where she went by the name Maria. 
It is here she fell in love with and married a man named George. Together, they had three children. Her body, however, was never suited for life on this planet, so she and her husband were made to leave what she calls their real children behind to return to her home planet, where they eventually conceived a fourth child, Geek. This means that yes, Geek is biologically related to Doug, Anna, and Lloyd too. George had a premonition that their newly born son would someday unleash an evil energy onto Earth and take it for himself. The only silver lining in this is that he knew the descendants of his other three children would have the power to stop him. George decided to travel back to Earth in the final years of his life and began laying down the pieces of a plan that would help these descendants defeat Geek when the time came, like hiding the melodies of that special lullaby Maria used to sing to Geek. After the Cosmic Destroyer had left for Earth, Maria followed after him in her own ship when the mother met with an unfortunate accident and was forced to create the subspace of Magicant to keep herself safe, albeit causing her memories to be lost in the process. Now hearing the completed lullaby once more in the current time, her spirit is able to become whole again, and so Magicant disappears while her soul joins George's in the afterlife. The purpose of their quest and what exactly they've been gathering has been made crystal clear, but there's still the problem of how to reach Geek. Wait, never mind, that solves itself when the black clouds of Mounty Toy begin to part and Geek descends in his mothership to reach them first. He cannot stand to be related by blood to such inferior creatures he sees as playthings, and so he's decreed they must perish before him. Geek attacks with shockwaves of wicked telepathy that brings the trio to their knees, sending dark thoughts to sear painfully through their brains. Doug notably cries out, Please, give us strength, in desperation, which is a nice parallel to Paula's prayers when fighting Gigas at the end of Mother 2. Geek's power to send out overwhelming, intrusive thoughts affects each child differently, targeting the guiltiest moments of their lives. For Anna, we're given a glimpse into her tragic backstory, detailing a car crash she lost both of her parents to. Anna was asleep in the back seat of the car, and had a dream she was playing a game with her father that involved covering his eyes and making him guess who's behind him. She was just playing with him in the dream, but because of her psychic powers, she inadvertently blinded him for real while he was driving, and it caused him to wreck the car. It's not her fault, well I guess technically it is, but she couldn't know or control what was happening, so on top of the general devastation of losing her parents, she also blames herself for their deaths. I wonder if having blinded her father was the reason she assisted the blind priest at her church too. For Doug, we learn that when he was just 8 years old, he had pushed his little sister Mimi down the stairs, which broke one of her legs. Geek leans into the motivation Doug initially had to push his kid sister in the first place, and tries to convince the boy that he did it because he wanted to kill her. That's right, you try to kill your sister. You try to kill her, you want her dead. Lloyd's dark thoughts here are comparatively pretty tame, but the poor kid has been bullied all of his life, so Geek just prepares a depressing montage of his classmates and parents calling him a coward. Geek also forces images of, quote, horrible, nightmarish things, like scenes straight from hell itself, things no human should ever see, unquote, into their minds as they try to sing the song. But if your HP is high enough to endure his wrath, he eventually won't be able to listen to the song any longer, likely due to the pain of losing his own mother, stirring conflicting feelings about humanity, and retreat back into the stars from whence he came. With Earth saved from the invasion, we're treated to a brief epilogue, which, hey, is more than Famicom players got, as the first version of Mother ends bluntly with Geek's surrender. In this epilogue, Doug throws away his inhaler, because I guess he can just decide not to have asthma anymore. I wish I could decide not to have OCD anymore. He then likens what the three of them learned from their arduous journey to the Wizard of Oz. Doug would be the Scarecrow, Anna the Tin Man, and Lloyd the Cowardly Lion. He then ponders who the Dorothy of the party would be, and the last line of the book reads, well, I guess that would be you, the one reading this book right now. That's what I'm talking about. I wish more endings would make me feel like I'm Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. There's no questionable themes of pregnancy to be found here like in the novel either, so that's a plus. There is a little bit more from the author in the afterword to read, which is neat because he describes Mystery Toy as being similar to the father in My Neighbor Totoro, Tatsuo Kusakabe, a character he actually voices. Like with Saori Kumi's novel, Akio Higuchi writes that Itoi gave him permission to arrange the story however he liked, so it wound up being a version of Mother that is very close to an original story. Having finished two of these original stories based on Mother, in addition to the real thing, I feel like I've leveled up as a fan, and you should too now that you've taken this journey with me. I'm very glad these alternate stories exist. Mother is the shortest of the trilogy, and I've beaten it twice now, but even still, it's easily the one I've invested the least amount of time into. So having external materials set in this world with these characters is exciting because it means I get to spend more time thinking about them, enriching my relationship with the original. 
from the lore-filled Mother Encyclopedia. To the official lyrics from songs in the Mother original soundtrack, there is no shortage of supplemental content to engage with and enhance a video game already filled to the brim with heart and ambition. The Mother series has not lost its luster to me over the years. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Despite how much I've read, written about, and have replayed these games over and over again, I find myself appreciating this trilogy a little bit more with every year that passes. Yeah, the most recent game in the series was released all the way back in 2006, but this fanbase will never let their fire burn out, as the core games are just that interesting. New material is constantly being produced or uncovered by talented fans too, whether it relates directly to Itoi's masterpieces or was inspired by them. This will be the last Dark Aspects of Mother episode until Earthbound 64 is found and dumped online, or something else substantial comes along. So I wanted to take a moment to express my gratitude for those of you who have been watching these videos over the years. Thank you! As for brand new Mother content, don't worry, I haven't run out of things to talk about, so you can expect more videos about my favorite series in the near and distant future. A big thank you to my patrons, Brian and Susan, Jennifer, Kathleen, Dat Barry, Tori, Captain Harlock, Janssen, and Nene. I also wanted to thank Clyde Mandolin, Kenny Sue, Niasu, Starman.net, and the Mother Forever team for even making these videos possible. And last but not least, I appreciate all of you who watched this video through to its end. Let it be known that you too are Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz.